Section 46 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in September 2012. Letter 37, Part 1. Biratori, Yezo, August 24th. I expected to have written out my notes on the Ainos in the comparative quiet and comfort of Sarufuto, but a delay in Benri's return and the non-arrival of the horses have compelled me to accept Ainu hospitality for another night, which involves living on tea and potatoes, for my stock of food is exhausted. In some respects I am glad to remain longer, as it enables me to go over my stock of words, as well as my notes, with the chief, who is intelligent, and it is a pleasure to find that his statements confirm those which have been made by the young man. The glamour which at first disguises the inherent barrenness of savage life has had time to pass away, and I see it in all its nakedness as a life not much raised above the necessities of animal existence, timid, monotonous, barren of good, dark, dull, without hope and without God in the world, though at its lowest and worst considerably higher and better than that of many other aboriginal races, and, must I say it, considerably higher and better than that of thousands of the lapsed masses of our own great cities, who are baptized into Christ's name and are laid at last in holy ground, inasmuch as the Ainos are truthful, and, on the whole, chaste, hospitable, honest, reverent, and kind to the aged. Drinking, their great vice, is not, as among us, an antagonism to their religion, but is actually a part of it, and as such would be exceptionally difficult to eradicate. The early darkness has once again come on, and once again the elders have assembled round the fire in two long lines, with the younger man at the ends. Pipichari, who yesterday sat in the place of honour and was helped to food first as the newest arrival, taking his place as the youngest at the end of the right-hand row. The birch-bark chips beam with fitful glare, the evening sake bowls are filled, the fire god and the garlanded god receive their libations. The ancient woman, still sitting like a fate, splits bark, and the younger women knot it, and the log fire lights up as magnificent a set of venerable heads a painter or sculptor would desire to see. Heads full of what? They have no history, their traditions are scarcely worthy the name, they claim descent from a dog, their houses and persons swarm with vermin, they are sunk in the grossest ignorance, they have no letters or any numbers above a thousand, they are clothed in the bark of trees and the untanned skins of beast, they worship the bear, the sun, moon, fire, water, and I know not what, they are uncivilizable and altogether irreclaimable savages. Yet they are attractive and in some ways fascinating, and I hope I shall never forget the music of their low, sweet voices, the soft light of their mild brown eyes, and the wonderful sweetness of their smile. After the yellow skins, the stiff horsehair, the feeble eyelids, the elongated eyes, the sloping eyebrows, the flat noses, the sunken chests, the Mongolian features, the puny physique, the shaky walk of the men, the restricted totter of the women, and the general impression of degeneracy conveyed by the appearance of the Japanese, the Ainos make a very singular impression. All but two or three that I have seen are the most ferocious-looking of savages, with a physique vigorous enough for carrying out the most ferocious intentions. But as soon as they speak, the countenance brightens into a smile as gentle as that of a woman, something which can never be forgotten. The men are about the middle height, broad-chested, broad-shouldered, thick-set, very strongly built, the arms and legs short, thick, and muscular, the hands and feet large. The bodies, and especially the limbs, of many are covered with short, bristly hair. I have seen two boys, whose backs are covered with fur as fine and soft as that of a cat. The heads and faces are very striking. 
the foreheads are very high broad and prominent and at first sight give one the impression of an unusual capacity for intellectual development the ears are small and set low the noses are straight but short and broad at the nostrils the mouths are wide but well formed and the lips rarely show a tendency to fullness the neck is short the cranium rounded the cheekbones low and the lower part of the face is small as compared with the upper the peculiarity called a jowl being unknown the eyebrows are full and form a straight line nearly across the face the eyes are large tolerably deeply set and very beautiful the colour a rich liquid brown the expression singularly soft and the eyelashes long silky and abundant the skin has the italian olive tint but in most cases is thin and light enough to show the changes of colour in the cheek the teeth are small regular and very white the incisors and eye-teeth are not disproportionately large as is usually the case among the japanese there is no tendency towards prognathism and the fold of integument which conceals the upper eyelids of the japanese is never to be met with the features expression and aspect are european rather than asiatic the ferocious savagery of the appearance of the man is produced by a profusion of thick soft black hair divided in the middle and falling in heavy masses nearly to the shoulders out of doors it is kept from falling over the face by a fillet round the brow the beards are equally profuse quite magnificent and generally wavy and in the case of the old man they give a truly patriarchal and venerable aspect in spite of the yellow tinge produced by smoke and want of cleanliness the savage look produced by the masses of hair and beard and the thick eyebrows is mitigated by the softness in the dreamy brown eyes and is altogether obliterated by the exceeding sweetness of the smile which belongs in greater or less degree to all the rougher sex i have measured the height of thirty of the adult men of this village and it ranges from five feet four inches to five feet six and a half inches the circumference of the heads averages twenty two point one inches and the arc from ear to ear thirteen inches according to mr davies the average weight of the ainu adult masculine brain ascertained by measurement of ainu skulls is forty five point nine zero ounces avoirdupois a brain weight said to exceed that of all the races hindu and mussulman on the indian plains and that of the aboriginal races of india and ceylon and is only paralleled by that of the races of the himalayas the siamese and the chinese burmese mr davis says further that it exceeds the mean brain weight of asiatic races in general yet with all this the ainos are a stupid people passing travellers who have seen a few of the aino women on the road to satsuporo speak of them as very ugly but as making amends for their ugliness by their industry and conjugal fidelity of the latter there is no doubt but i am not disposed to admit the former the ugliness is certainly due to art and dirt the aino women seldom exceed five feet and half an inch in height but they are beautifully formed straight lithe and well developed with small feet and hands well arched insteps rounded limbs well developed busts and a firm elastic gait their heads and faces are small but the hair which falls in masses on each side of the face like that of the man is equally redundant they have superb teeth and display them liberally in smiling their mouths are somewhat wide but well formed and they have a ruddy comeliness about them which is pleasing in spite of the disfigurement of the band which is tattooed both above and below the mouth and which by being united at the corners enlarges its apparent size and width a girl at shiraoi who for some reason has not been subjected to this process is the most beautiful creature in features colouring and natural grace of form that i have seen for a long time their complexions are lighter than those of the men there are not many here even as dark as our european brunettes 
a few unite the eyebrows by a streak of tattooing so as to produce a straight line like the men they cut their hair short for two or three inches above the nape of the neck but instead of using a fillet they take two locks from the front and tie them at the back they are universally tattooed not only with the broad band above and below the mouth but with a band across the knuckles succeeded by an elaborate pattern on the back of the hand and a series of bracelets extending to the elbow the process of disfigurement begins at the age of five when some of the sufferers are yet unweaned i saw the operation performed on a dear little bright girl this morning a woman took a large knife with a sharp edge and rapidly cut several horizontal lines on the upper lip following closely the curve of the very pretty mouth and before the slight breathing had ceased carefully rubbed in some of the shiny soot which collects on the mat above the fire in two or three days the scarred lip will be washed with the decoction of the bark of a tree to fix the pattern and give it that blue look which makes many people mistake it for a daub of paint a child who had the second process performed yesterday has her lip fearfully swollen and inflamed the latest victim held her hands clasped tightly together while the cuts were inflicted but never cried the pattern on the lips is deepened and widened every year up to the time of marriage and the circles on the arm are extended in a similar way the man cannot give any reason for the universality of this custom it is an old custom they say and part of their religion and no woman could marry without it benri fancies that the japanese custom of blackening the teeth is equivalent to it but he is mistaken as that ceremony usually succeeds marriage they begin to tattoo the arms when a girl is five or six and work from the elbow downwards they express themselves as very much grieved and tormented by the recent prohibition of tattooing they say the gods will be angry and that the women can't marry unless they are tattooed and they implored both mr von siebold and me to intercede with the japanese government on their behalf in this respect they are less apathetic on this than on any subject and repeat frequently it's a part of our religion the children are very pretty and attractive and their faces give promise of an intelligence which is lacking in those of the adults they are much loved and are caressing as well as caressed the infants of the mountain ainos have seeds of millet put into their mouths as soon as they are born and those of the coast ainos a morsel of salt fish and whatever be the hour of birth custom requires that they shall not be fed until a night has passed they are not weaned until they are at least three years old boys are preferred to girls but both are highly valued and a childless wife may be divorced children do not receive names till they are four or five years old and then the father chooses a name by which his child is afterwards known young children when they travel are either carried on their mother's backs in a net or in the back of the loose garment but in both cases the weight is mainly supported by a broad band which passes round the woman's forehead when men carry them they hold them in their arms the hair of very young children is shaven and from about five to fifteen the boys wear either a large tonsure or tufts above the ears while the girls are allowed to grow hair all over their heads implicit and prompt obedience is required from infancy and from a very early age the children are utilized by being made to fetch and carry and go on messages i have seen children apparently not more than two years old sent for wood and even at this age they are so thoroughly trained in the observances of etiquette that babies just able to walk never toddle into or out of this house without formal salutations to each person within it the mother alone excepted they don't wear any clothing till they are seven or eight years old and are then dressed like their elders their manners to their parents are very affectionate even today in the chief's awe-inspiring presence one dear little nude creature who had been sitting quietly for two hours staring into the fire with her big brown eyes rushed to meet her mother when she entered and threw her arms round her 
to which the woman responded by a look of true maternal tenderness and a kiss. These little creatures, in the absolute unconsciousness of innocence, with their beautiful faces, olive-tinted bodies, all the darker, said to say, from dirt, their perfect docility and absence of prying curiosity are very bewitching. They all wear silver or pewter ornaments tied round their necks by a wisp of blue cotton. Apparently the ordinary infantile maladies, such as whooping cough and measles, do not afflict the Ainos fatally, but the children suffer from a cutaneous affection which wears off as they reach the age of ten or eleven years, as well as from severe toothache with their first teeth. End of section 46 Section 47 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 37, Part 2. I know clothing, for savages, is exceptionally good. In the winter it consists of one, two, or more coats of skin, with hoods of the same, to which the men add rude moccasins when they go out hunting. In summer they wear kimonos, or loose coats, made of cloth woven from the split bark of a forest tree. This is a durable and beautiful fabric in varial shades of natural buff, and somewhat resembles what is known to fancy workers as Panama canvas. Under this, a skin or bark cloth vest may or may not be worn. The men wear these coats reaching a little below the knees, folded over from right to left, and confined at the waist by a narrow girdle of the same cloth, to which is attached a rude dagger-shaped knife with a carved and engraved wooden handle and sheath. Smoking is by no means a general practice, Consequently, the pipe and tobacco box are not, as with the Japanese, a part of ordinary male attire. Tightly fitting leggings, either of bark cloth or skin, are worn by both sexes, but neither shoes nor sandals. The coat worn by the women reaches halfway between the knees and ankles, and is quite loose and without a girdle. It is fastened the whole way up to the collar bone, and not only is the Aino woman completely covered, but she will not change one garment for another except alone or in the dark. Lately, a Japanese woman at Sarufuto took an Aino woman into her house and insisted on her taking a bath, which she absolutely refused to do till the bathhouse had been made quite private by means of screens. On the Japanese woman going back a little later to see what had become of her, she found her sitting in the water in her clothes, and on being remonstrated with, she said that the gods would be angry if they saw her without clothes. Many of the garments for holiday occasions are exceedingly handsome, being decorated with geometrical patterns in which the Greek fret takes part, in coarse blue cotton braided most dexterously with scarlet and white thread. Some of the handsomest take half a year to make. The masculine dress is completed by an apron of oblong shape decorated in the same elaborate manner. These handsome savages with their powerful physique look remarkably well in their best clothes. I have not seen a boy or girl above nine who is not thoroughly clothed. The jewels of the women are large hoop earrings of silver or pewter, with attachments of a classical pattern, and silver neck ornaments, and a few have brass bracelets soldered upon their arms. The women have a perfect passion for every hue of red, and I have made friends with them by dividing among them a large turkey-red silk handkerchief, strips of which are already being utilized for the ornamenting of coats. The houses in the five villages up here are very good. So they are at Horobetsu, but at Shiraoi, where the aborigines suffer from the close proximity of several grog shops, they are inferior. They differ in many ways from any that I have before seen, approaching most nearly to the grass houses of the natives of Hawaii. Custom does not appear to permit either of variety or innovations, 
In all, the style is the same, and the difference consists in the size and plenishings. The dwellings seem ill-fitted for a rigorous climate, but the same thing may be said of those of the Japanese. In their houses, as in their faces, the Ainos are more European than their conquerors, as they possess doorways, windows, central fireplaces, like those of the Highlanders of Scotland, and raised sleeping places. The usual appearance is that of a small house built on the end of a larger one. The small house is the vestibule or ante-room, and is entered by a low doorway screened by a heavy mat of reeds. It contains the large wooden mortar and pestle with two ends, used for pounding millet, a wooden receptacle for millet, nets or hunting gear, and some bundles of reeds for repairing roof or walls. This room never contains a window. From it, the large room is entered by a doorway, over which a heavy reed mat, bound with hide, invariably hangs. This room, in Benri's case, is 35 feet long by 25 feet broad. Another is 45 feet square. The smallest measures 20 feet by 15. On entering, one is much impressed by the great height and steepness of the roof, altogether out of proportion to the height of the walls. The frame of the house is of posts, four feet ten inches high, placed four feet apart, and sloping slightly inwards. The height of the walls is apparently regulated by that of the reeds, of which only one length is used, and which never exceed four feet ten inches. The posts are scooped at the top, and heavy poles resting on the scoops are laid along them to form the top of the wall. The posts are again connected twice by slighter poles tied on horizontally. The wall is double, the outer part being formed of reeds tied very neatly to the framework in small, regular bundles, the inner layer or wall being made of reeds attached singly. From the top of the pole, which is secured to the top of the posts, the framework of the roof rises to a height of 22 feet, made, like the rest, of poles tied to a heavy and roughly hewn ridge beam. At one end, under the ridge beam, there is a large triangular aperture for the exit of smoke. Two very stout, roughly hewn beams cross the width of the house, resting on the posts of the wall and on props let into the floor, and a number of poles are laid at the same height, by means of which a secondary roof formed of mats can be at once extemporized, but this is only used for guests. These poles answer the same purpose as shelves. Very great care is bestowed upon the outside of the roof, which is a marvel of neatness and prettiness, and has the appearance of a series of frills being thatched in ridges. The ridge pole is very thickly covered, and the thatch both there and at the corners is elaborately laced with a pattern in strong peeled twigs. The poles, which, for much of the room, run from wall to wall, compel one to stoop to avoid fracturing one's skull, and bringing down spears, bows and arrows, arrow traps and other primitive property. The roof and rafters are black and shiny from wood smoke. Immediately under them, at one end and one side, are small square windows which are closed at night by wooden shutters, which during the daytime hang by ropes. Nothing is a greater insult to an Aino than to look in at his window. On the left of the doorway is invariably a fixed wooden platform, 18 inches high and covered with a single mat, which is the sleeping place. The pillows are small, stiff bolsters covered with ornamental matting. If the family be large, there are several of these sleeping platforms. A pole runs horizontally at a fitting distance above the outside edge of each, over which mats are thrown to conceal the sleepers from the rest of the room. The inside half of these mats is plain, but the outside, which is seen from the room, has a diamond pattern woven into it in dull reds and browns. The whole floor is covered with a very coarse reed mat, with interstices half an inch wide. The fireplace, which is six feet long, is oblong. 
above it on a very black and elaborate framework hangs a very black and shiny mat whose superfluous suit forms the basis of the stain used in tattooing and whose apparent purpose is to prevent the smoke ascending and to diffuse it equally throughout the room from this framework depends the great cooking pot which plays a most important part in aino economy household gods form an essential part of the furnishing of every house in this one at the left of the entrance there are ten white wands with shavings depending from the upper end stuck in the wall another projects from the window which faces the sunrise and the great god a white post two feet high with spirals of shavings depending from the top is always planted in the floor near the wall on the left side opposite the fire between the platform bed of the householder and the low broad shelf placed invariably on the same side and which is a singular feature of all aino houses coast and mountain down to the poorest containing as it does japanese curios many of them very valuable objects of antique art though much destroyed by damp and dust they are true curiosities in the dwellings of these northern aborigines and look almost solemn ranged against a wall in this house there are twenty-four lacquered urns or tea-chests or seats each standing two feet high on four small legs shod with engraved or filigree brass between these are eight lacquered tubs and a number of bowls and lacquer trays and above are spares with inlaid handles and fine kaga and avata bowls the lacquer is good and several of the urns have daimyo's crests in gold upon them one urn and a large covered bowl are beautifully inlaid with venus's ear the great urns are to be seen in every house and in addition there are suits of inlaid armor and swords with inlaid hilts engraved blades and repousse scabbards for which a collector would give almost anything no offers however liberal can tempt them to sell any of these antique possessions they were presents they say in their low musical voices they were presents from those who were kind to our fathers no we cannot sell them they were presents and so gold lacquer and pearl inlaying and gold niello work and daimyo's crests in gold continue to gleam in the smoky darkness of their huts some of these things were doubtless gifts to their fathers when they went to pay tribute to the representative of the shogun and the prince of matsumae soon after the conquest of yezo others were probably gifts from samurai who took refuge here during the rebellion and some must have been obtained by barter they are the one possession which they will not barter for sake and are only parted with in payment of fines at the command of a chief or as the dower of a girl except in the poorest houses where the people can only afford to lay down a mat for a guest they cover the coarse mat with fine ones on each side of the fire these mats and the bark cloth are really their only manufactures they are made of fine reeds with a pattern in dull reds or browns and are fourteen feet long by three feet six inches wide it takes a woman eight days to make one of them in every house there are one or two movable platforms six feet by four and fourteen inches high which are placed at the head of the fireplace and on which guests sit and sleep on a bearskin or a fine mat in many houses there are broad seats a few inches high on which the elder men sit cross-legged as their custom is not squatting japanese fashion on the heels a water tub always rests on a stand by the door and the dried fish and venison or bear for daily use hang from the rafters as well as a few skins besides these things there are a few absolute necessaries lacquer or wooden bowls for food and sake a chopping board and rude chopping knife a cleft stick for burning strips of birch bark a triply cleft stick for supporting the potsherd in which on rare occasions they burn a wick with oil the component parts of their rude loom the bark of which they make their clothes the reeds of which they make their mats 
and the inventory of the essentials of their life is nearly complete. No iron enters into the construction of their houses, its place being supplied by a remarkably tenacious fibre. I have before described the preparation of their food, which usually consists of a stew of abominable things. They eat salt and fresh fish, dried fish, seaweed, slugs, the various vegetables which grow in the wilderness of tall weeds which surrounds their villages, wild roots and berries, fresh and dried venison and bear, their carnival consisting of fresh bear's flesh and sake, seaweed, mushrooms, and anything they can get, in fact, which is not poisonous, mixing everything up together. They use a wooden spoon for stirring and eat with chopsticks. They have only two regular meals a day, but eat very heartily. In addition to the eatables just mentioned, they have a thick soup made from a putty-like clay which is found in one or two of the valleys. This is boiled with the bulb of a wild lily, and, after much of the clay has been allowed to settle, the liquid, which is very thick, is poured off. In the north, a valley where this earth is found is called Tsie Toinai, literally, Eat Earth Valley. The men spend the autumn, winter and spring in hunting deer and bears. Part of their tribute or taxes is paid in skins, and they subsist on the dried meat. Up to about this time, the Ainos have obtained these beasts by means of poisoned arrows, arrow traps and pitfalls, but the Japanese government has prohibited the use of poison and arrow traps, and these men say that hunting is becoming extremely difficult, as the wild animals are driven back farther and farther into the mountains by the sound of the guns. However, they add significantly, the eyes of the Japanese government are not in every place. Their bows are only three feet long and are made of stout saplings with the bark on, and there is no attempt to render them light or shapely at the ends. The wood is singularly inelastic. The arrows, of which I have obtained a number, are very peculiar and are made in three pieces, the point consisting of a sharpened piece of bone with an elongated cavity on one side for the reception of the poison. This point, or head, is very slightly fastened by a lashing of bark to a fusiform piece of bone about four inches long, which is in its turn lashed to a shaft about fourteen inches long, the other end of which is sometimes equipped with a triple feather, and sometimes is not. The poison is placed in the elongated cavity in the head in a very soft state, and hardens afterwards. In some of the arrowheads, fully half a teaspoonful of the paste is inserted. From the nature of the very slight lashings which attach the arrowhead to the shaft, it constantly remains fixed in the slight wound that it makes, while the shaft falls off. Pipichari has given me a small quantity of the poisonous paste, and has also taken me to see the plant from the root of which it is made, the Aconitum japonicum, a monk's hood, whose tall spikes of blue flowers are brightening the brushwood in all directions. The root is pounded into a pulp, mixed with a reddish earth like an iron ore pulverized, and again with animal fat, before being placed in the arrow. It has been said that the poison is prepared for use by being buried in the earth, but Benneri says that this is needless. They claim for it that a single wound kills a bear in ten minutes, but that the flesh is not rendered unfit for eating, though they take the precaution of cutting away a considerable quantity of it round the wound. Dr. Eldridge, formerly of Hakodate, obtained a small quantity of the poison, and, after trying some experiments with it, came to the conclusion that it is less virulent than other poisons employed for a like purpose, as by the natives of Java, the Bushmen, and certain tribes of the Amazon and Orinoco. The Ainos say that if a man is accidentally wounded by a poisoned arrow, the only cure is immediate excision of the part. I do not wonder that the government has prohibited arrow traps, for they made locomotion unsafe, and it is still unsafe a little farther north, where the hunters are more out of observation than here. 
The traps consist of a large bow with a poisoned arrow, fixed in such a way that when the bear walks over a cord which is attached to it, he is simultaneously transfixed. I have seen as many as fifty in one house. The simple contrivance for inflicting this silent death is most ingenious. The women are occupied all day, as I have before said. They look cheerful and even merry when they smile, and are not like the Japanese, prematurely old, partly perhaps because their houses are well ventilated and the use of charcoal is unknown. I do not think that they undergo the unmitigated drudgery which falls to the lot of most savage women, though they work hard. The men do not like them to speak to strangers, however, and say that their place is to work and rear children. They eat of the same food, and at the same time as the men, laugh and talk before them, and receive equal support and respect in old age. They sell mats and bark cloth in the peace, and made up when they can, and their husbands do not take their earnings from them. All I know women understand the making of bark cloth. The men bring in the bark in strips, five feet long, having removed the outer coating. This inner bark is easily separated into several thin layers, which are split into very narrow strips by the older women, very neatly knotted, and wound into balls weighing about a pound each. No preparation of either the bark or the thread is required to fit it for weaving, but I observe that some of the women steep it in a decoction of a bark which produces a brown dye to deepen the buff tint. The loom is so simple that I almost fear to represent it as complicated by description. It consists of a stout hook fixed in the floor, to which the threads of the far end of the web are secured, a cord fastening the near end to the waist of the worker, who supplies, by dexterous rigidity, the necessary tension a frame like a comb resting on the ankles, through which the threads pass, a hollow roll for keeping the upper and under threads separate, a spatula-shaped shuttle of engraved wood, and the roller on which the cloth is rolled as it is made. The length of the web is fifteen feet, and the width of the cloth fifteen inches. It is woven with great regularity, and the knots in the thread are carefully kept on the underside. It is a very slow and fatiguing process, and a woman cannot do much more than a foot a day. The weaver sits on the floor with the whole arrangement attached to her waist, and the loom, if such it may be called, on her ankles. It takes long practice before she can supply the necessary tension by spinal rigidity. As the work proceeds, she drags herself almost imperceptibly nearer the hook. In this house and other large ones, two or three women bring in their webs in the morning, fix their hooks, and weave all day, while others, who have not equal advantages, put their hooks in the ground and weave in the sunshine. The web and loom can be bundled up in two minutes and carried away quite as easily as a knitted soft blanket. It is the simplest and perhaps the most primitive form of hand loom, and comb, shuttle, and roll are all easily fashioned with an ordinary knife. End of section 47 Section 48 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Awaii in October 2012 Letter 37, Part 3 There cannot be anything more vague and destitute of cohesion than Aino religious notions. With the exception of the hill shrines of Japanese construction dedicated to Yoshitsune, they have no temples, and they have neither priests, sacrifices, nor worship. Apparently through all traditional time their cultus has been the rudest and most primitive form of nature worship, the attaching of a vague sacredness to trees, rivers, rocks and mountains, and of vague notions of power for good or evil to the sea, the forest, the fire, and the sun and moon. I cannot make out that they possess a trace of the deification of ancestors, though their rude nature-worship may well have been the primitive form of Japanese Shinto. 
the solitary exception to their adoration of animate and inanimate nature appears to be the reverence paid to yoshitsune to whom they believe they are greatly indebted and who it is supposed by some will yet interfere on their behalf their gods that is the outward symbols of their religion corresponding most likely with the shinto gohei are wands and posts of peeled wood whittled nearly to the top from which the pendant shavings fall down in white curls these are not only set up in their houses sometimes to the number of twenty but on precipices banks of rivers and streams and mountain passes and such wands are thrown into the rivers as the boatmen descend rapids and dangerous places since my baggage horse fell over an acclivity on the trail from sarufuto four such wands have been placed there it is nonsense to write of the religious ideas of a people who have none and of beliefs among people who are merely adult children the traveller who formulates an aino creed must evolve it from his inner consciousness i have taken infinite trouble to learn from themselves what their religious notions are and shinondi tells me that they have told me all they know and the whole sum is a few vague fears and hopes and a suspicion that there are things outside themselves more powerful than themselves whose good influences may be obtained or whose evil influences may be averted by libations of sake the word worship is in itself misleading when i use it of these savages it simply means libations of sake waving bowls and waving hands without any spiritual act of deprecation or supplication in such a sense and such alone they worship the sun and moon but not the stars the forest and the sea the wolf the black snake the owl and several other beasts and birds have the word kamoi god attached to them as the wolf is the howling god the owl the bird of the gods a black snake the raven god but none of these things are now worshipped wolf worship having quite lately died out thunder the voice of the gods inspires some fear the sun they say is their best god and the fire their next best obviously the divinities from whom their greatest benefits are received some idea of gratitude pervades their rude notions as in the case of the worship paid to yoshitsune and it appears in one of the rude recitations chanted at the saturnalia which in several places conclude the hunting and fishing seasons to the sea which nourishes us to the forest which protects us we present our grateful thanks you are two mothers that nourish the same child do not be angry if we leave one to go to the other. The Ainos will always be the pride of the forest and of the sea. The solitary act of sacrifice which they perform is the placing of a worthless dead bird, something like a sparrow, near one of their peeled wands, where it is left till it reaches an advanced stage of putrefaction. To drink for the god is the chief act of worship, and thus drunkenness and religion are inseparably connected, as the more sake the Ainos drink, the more devout they are, and the better pleased are the gods. It does not appear that anything but sake is of sufficient value to please the god. The libations to the fire and the peeled post are never omitted, and are always accompanied by the inward waving of the sake bowls the peculiarity which distinguishes this rude mythology is the worship of the bear the yezo bear being one of the finest of his species but it is impossible to understand the feelings by which it is prompted for they worship it after their fashion and set up its head in their villages yet they trap it kill it eat it and sell its skin there is no doubt that this wild beast inspires more of the feeling which prompts worship than the inanimate forces of nature, and the Ainos may be distinguished as bear worshippers, and their greatest religious festival or Saturnalia as the festival of the bear. Gentle and peaceable as they are, they have a great admiration for fierceness and courage, and the bear, which is the strongest, fiercest, and most courageous animal known to them, has probably in all ages inspired them with veneration. 
Some of their rude chants are in praise of the bear, and their highest eulogy on a man is to compare him to a bear. Thus Shinondi said of Benri, the chief, He is as strong as a bear, and the old fate praising Pipichari called him the young bear. In all Aino villages, especially near the chief's house, there are several tall poles with the fleshless skull of a bear on the top of each, and in most there is also a large cage, made gridiron fashion, of stout timbers, and raised two or three feet from the ground. At the present time such cages contain young but well-grown bears, captured when quite small in the early spring. After the capture, the bear cub is introduced into a dwelling house, generally that of the chief or sub-chief, where it is suckled by a woman and played with by the children till it grows too big and rough for domestic ways, and is placed in a strong cage in which it is fed and cared for, as I understand, till the autumn of the following year, when, being strong and well-grown, the festival of the bear is celebrated. The customs of this festival vary considerably, and the manner of the bear's death differs among the mountain and coast Ainos, but everywhere there is a great gathering of the people, and it is the occasion of a great feast, accompanied with much sake and a curious dance, in which men alone take part. Yells and shouts are used to excite the bear, and when he becomes much agitated, a chief shoots him with an arrow, inflicting a slight wound which maddens him, on which the bars of the cage are raised, and he springs forth, very furious. At this stage the Ainos run upon him with various weapons, each one striving to inflict a wound, as it brings luck to draw his blood. As soon as he falls down exhausted, his head is cut off, and the weapons with which he has been wounded are offered to it, and he is asked to avenge himself upon them. Afterwards the carcass, amidst a frenzied uproar, is distributed among the people, and amidst feasting and riot, the head, placed upon a pole, is worshipped, that is, it receives libations of sake, and the festival closes with general intoxication. In some villages it is customary for the foster mother of the bear to utter piercing wails while he is delivered to his murderers, and after he is slain to beat each one of them with a branch of a tree. Afterwards at Uzu, on Volcano Bay, the old men told me that at their festival they dispatched the bear after a different manner. On letting it loose from the cage, two men seize it by the ears, and others simultaneously place a long, stout pole across the nape of its neck, upon which a number of Ainos mount, and after a prolonged struggle the neck is broken. As the bear is seen to approach his end, they shout in chorus, We kill you, O bear! Come back soon into an Aino! When a bear is trapped or wounded by an arrow, the hunters go through an apologetic or propitiatory ceremony. They appear to have certain rude ideas of metempsychosis, as is evident by the Uzu prayer to the bear and certain rude traditions, but whether these are indigenous or have arisen by contact with Buddhism at a later period is impossible to say. They have no definite ideas concerning a future state, and the subject is evidently not a pleasing one to them. Such notions as they have are few and confused. Some think that the spirits of their friends go into wolves and snakes, others that they wander about the forests, and they are much afraid of ghosts. A few think that they go to a good or bad place, according to their deeds, but Shinondi said, and there was an infinite pathos in his words, How can we know? No one ever came back to tell us. On asking him what were bad deeds, he said, Being bad to parents, stealing, and telling lies. The future, however, does not occupy any place in their thoughts, and they can hardly be said to believe in the immortality of the soul, though their fear of ghosts shows that they recognize a distinction between body and spirit. Their social customs are very simple. Girls never marry before the age of seventeen, or men before twenty-one. When a man wishes to marry, he thinks of some particular girl, 
and asks the chief if he may ask for her. If leave is given, either through a go-between or personally, he asks her father for her, and if he consents, the bridegroom gives him a present, usually a Japanese curio. This constitutes betrothal, and the marriage, which immediately follows, is celebrated by carousals and the drinking of much sake. The bride receives as her dowry her earrings and a highly ornamented kimono. It is an essential that the husband provides a house to which to take his wife. Each couple lives separately, and even the eldest son does not take his bride to his father's house. Polygamy is only allowed in two cases. The chief may have three wives, but each must have her separate house. Benri has two wives, but it appears that he took the second because the first was childless. The Uzu Ainos told me that among the tribes of Volcano Bay, polygamy is not practiced, even by the chiefs. It is also permitted in the case of a childless wife, but there is no instance of it in Biratori, and the men say that they prefer to have one wife, as two quarrel. Widows are allowed to marry again with the chief's consent, but among these mountain Ainos a woman must remain absolutely secluded within the house of her late husband for a period varying from six to twelve months, only going to the door at intervals to throw sake to the right and left. A man secludes himself similarly for thirty days. So greatly do the customs vary that round Volcano Bay I found that the period of seclusion for a widow is only thirty days, and for a man twenty-five, but that after a father's death, the house in which he has lived is burned down after the thirty days of seclusion, and the widow and her children go to a friend's house for three years, after which the house is rebuilt on its former site. If a man does not like his wife, by obtaining the chief's consent he can divorce her, but he must send her back to her parents with plenty of good clothes. But divorce is impracticable where there are children, and is rarely, if ever, practised. Conjugal fidelity is a virtue among Aino women, but custom provides that, in case of unfaithfulness, the injured husband may bestow his wife upon her paramour, if he be an unmarried man, in which case the chief fixes the amount of damages which the paramour must pay, and these are usually valuable Japanese curios. The old and blind people are entirely supported by their children, and receive until their dying day filial reverence and obedience. If one man steals from another, he must return what he has taken, and give the injured man a present besides, the value of which is fixed by the chief. Their mode of living you already know, as I have shared it, and am still receiving their hospitality. Custom enjoins the exercise of hospitality on every I know. They receive all strangers as they received me, giving them of their best, placing them in the most honourable place, bestowing gifts upon them, and, when they depart, furnishing them with cakes of boiled millet. They have few amusements except certain feasts. Their dance, which they have just given in my honour, is slow and mournful, and their songs are chants or recitative. They have a musical instrument, something like a guitar, with three, five or six strings, which are made from sinews of whales cast upon the shore. They have another, which is believed to be peculiar to themselves, consisting of a thin piece of wood, about five inches long and two and a half inches broad, with a pointed wooden tongue about two lines in breadth and sixteen in length, fixed in the middle, and grooved on three sides. The wood is held before the mouth, and the tongue is set in motion by the vibration of the breath in singing. Its sound, though less penetrating, is as discordant as that of a Jew's harp, which it somewhat resembles. One of the men used it as an accompaniment of a song, but they are unwilling to part with them, as they say that it is very seldom that they can find a piece of wood which will bear the fine splitting necessary for the tongue. They are a most courteous people among each other. The salutations are frequent, 
on entering a house, on leaving it, on meeting on the road, on receiving anything from the hand of another, and on receiving a kind or complimentary speech. They do not make any acknowledgments of this kind to the women, however. The common salutation consists in extending the hands and waving them inwards, once or oftener, and stroking the beard. The formal one in raising the hands with an inward curve to the level of the head two or three times, lowering them and rubbing them together, the ceremony concluding with stroking the beard several times. The latter and more formal mode of salutation is offered to the chief and by the young to the old. The women have no manners. They have no medicine men, and although they are aware of the existence of healing herbs, they do not know their special virtues or the manner of using them. Dried and pounded bear's liver is their specific, and they place much reliance on it in colic and other pains. They are a healthy race. In this village of three hundred souls there are no chronically ailing people, nothing but one case of bronchitis, and some cutaneous maladies among children. Neither is there any case of deformity in this and five other large villages which I have visited, except that of a girl who has one leg slightly shorter than the other. They ferment a kind of intoxicating liquor from the root of a tree, and also from their own millet and Japanese rice. But Japanese sake is the one thing that they care about. They spend all their gains upon it and drink it in enormous quantities. It represents to them all the good of which they know or can conceive. Beastly intoxication is the highest happiness to which these poor savages aspire, and the condition is sanctified to them under the fiction of drinking to the gods. Men and women alike indulge in this vice. A few, however, like Pipichari, abstain from it totally, taking the bowl in their hands, making the libations to the gods, and then passing it on. I asked Pipichari why he did not take sake, and he replied with a truthful terseness, because it makes men like dogs. Except a chief who has two horses, they have no domestic animals except very large yellow dogs, which are used in hunting, but are never admitted within the houses. The habits of the people, though by no means destitute of decency and propriety, are not cleanly. The women bathe their hands once a day, but any other washing is unknown. They never wash their clothes and wear the same by day and night. I am afraid to speculate on the condition of their wealth of coal black hair. They may be said to be very dirty, as dirty fully as masses of our people at home. Their houses swarm with fleas, but they are not worse in this respect than the Japanese yadoyas. The mountain villages have, however, the appearance of extreme cleanliness, being devoid of litter, heaps, puddles, and untidiness of all kinds, and there are no unpleasant odours inside or outside the houses, as they are well ventilated and smoked, and the salt fish and meat are kept in the go-downs. The hair and beards of the old men, instead of being snowy as they ought to be, are yellow from smoke and dirt. They have no mode of computing time and do not know their own ages. To them the past is dead, yet, like other conquered and despised races, they cling to the idea that in some far-off age they were a great nation. They have no traditions of internecine strife, and the art of war seems to have been lost long ago. I asked Benri about this matter, and he says that formerly Ainos fought with spears and knives as well as with bows and arrows, but that Yoshitsune, the hero god, forbade war for ever, and since then the two-aged spear, with a shaft nine feet long, has only been used in hunting bears. The Japanese government, of course, exercises the same authority over the Ainos as over its other subjects, but probably it does not care to interfere in domestic or tribal matters, and within this outside limit, despotic authority is vested in the chiefs. The Ainos live in village communities, and each community has its own chief, who is its lord paramount. 
it appears to me that this chieftainship is but an expansion of the paternal relation and that all the village families are ruled as a unit benri in whose house i am is the chief of biratori and is treated by all with very great deference of manner the office is nominally for life but if a chief becomes blind or too infirm to go about he appoints a successor if he has a smart son who he thinks will command the respect of the people he appoints him but if not he chooses the most suitable man in the village the people are called upon to approve the choice but their ratification is never refused the office is not hereditary anywhere benri appears to exercise the authority of a very strict father his manner to all the men is like that of a master to slaves and they bow whenever they speak to him no one can marry without his approval if any one builds a house he chooses the site he has absolute jurisdiction in civil and criminal cases unless which is very rare the letter should be of sufficient magnitude to be reported to the imperial officials he compels restitution of stolen property, and in all cases fixes the fines which are to be paid by delinquents. He also fixes the hunting arrangements and the festivals. The younger men were obviously much afraid of incurring his anger in his absence. An eldest son does not appear to be, as among the Japanese, a privileged person. He does not necessarily inherit the house and curios. The latter are not divided, but go with the house to the son whom the father regards as being the smartest. Formal adoption is practised. Pipichari is an adopted son and is likely to succeed to Benri's property to the exclusion of his own children. I cannot get at the word which is translated smartness, but I understand it as meaning general capacity. The chief, as I have mentioned before, is allowed three wives among the mountain Ainos. Otherwise, authority seems to be his only privilege. The Ainos have a singular dread of snakes. Even their bravest fly from them. One man says that it is because they know of no cure for their bite. But there is something more than this, for they flee from snakes which they know to be harmless. They have an equal dread of their dead. Death seems to them very specially the shadow feared of man. When it comes, which is usually from bronchitis in old age, the corpse is dressed in its best clothing and laid upon a shelf for from one to three days. In the case of a woman, her ornaments are buried with her, and in that of a man, his knife and sake stick, and, if he were a smoker, his smoking apparatus. The corpse is sewn up with these things in a mat, and, being slung on poles, is carried to a solitary grave where it is laid in a recumbent position. Nothing will induce an Aino to go near a grave. Even if a valuable bird or animal falls near one, he will not go to pick it up. A vague dread is forever associated with the departed, and no dream of paradise ever lights for the Aino the Stygian shades. Benri is, for an Aino, intelligent. Two years ago Mr. Denning of Hakodate came up here and told him that there was but one God who made us all, to which the shrewd old man replied, If the God who made you made us, how is it that you are so different, you so rich, we so poor? On asking him about the magnificent pieces of lacquer and inlaying which adorn his curio shelf, he said that they were his father's, grandfather's, and great-grandfather's at least, and he thinks they were gift from the daimyo of Matsumae soon after the conquest of Yezo. He is a grand-looking man, in spite of the havoc wrought by his intemperate habits. There is plenty of room in the house, and this morning, when I asked him to show me the use of the spear, he looked a truly magnificent savage, stepping well back with the spear in rest, and then springing forward for the attack, his arms and legs turning into iron, the big muscles standing out in knots, his frame quivering with excitement, the thick hair falling back in masses from his brow, and the fire of the chase in his eye. 
I trembled for my boy, who was the object of the imaginary onslaught. The passion of sport was so admirably acted. As I write, seven of the older men are sitting by the fire. Their great beards fall to their waists in rippled masses, and the slight baldness of age not only gives them a singularly venerable appearance, but enhances the beauty of their lofty brows. I took a rough sketch of one of the handsomest, and, showing it to him, asked if he would have it, but instead of being amused or pleased he showed symptoms of fear and asked me to burn it, saying it would bring him bad luck and he should die. However, Ito pacified him, and he accepted it, after a Chinese character, which is understood to mean good luck, had been written upon it, but all the others begged me not to make pictures of them, except Pipichari, who lies at my feet like a stag-hound. The profusion of black hair and a curious intensity about their eyes, coupled with the hairy limbs and singularly vigorous physique, give them a formidably savage appearance, but the smile, full of sweetness and light, in which both eyes and mouth bear part, and the low musical voice, softer and sweeter than anything I have previously heard, make me at times forget that they are savages at all. The venerable look of these old men harmonizes with the singular dignity and courtesy of their manners, but as I look at the grand heads, and reflect that the Ainos have never shown any capacity, and are merely adult children, they seem to suggest water on the brain, rather than intellect. I am more and more convinced that the expression of their faces is European. It is truthful, straightforward, manly, but both it and the tone of voice are strongly tinged with pathos. Before these elders, Benri asked me, in a severe tone, if I had been annoyed in any way during his absence. He feared, he said, that the young men and the women would crowd about me rudely. I made a complimentary speech in return, and all the ancient hands were waved, and the venerable beards were stroked in acknowledgment. These Ainos, doubtless, stand high among uncivilized peoples. They are, however, as completely irreclaimable as the wildest of nomad tribes, and contact with civilization, where it exists, only debases them. Several young Ainos were sent to Tokyo, and educated and trained in various ways, but as soon as they returned to Yezo, they relapsed into savagery, retaining nothing but a knowledge of Japanese. They are charming in many ways, but make one sad, too, by their stupidity, apathy, and hopelessness, and all the sadder that their numbers appear to be again increasing, and as their physique is very fine, there does not appear to be a prospect of the race dying out at present. They are certainly superior to many Aborigines, as they have an approach to domestic life. They have one word for house, and another for home, and one word for husband, approaches very nearly to houseband. Truth is of value in their eyes, and this in itself raises them above some peoples. Infanticide is unknown, and aged parents receive filial reverence, kindness, and support, while in their social and domestic relations there is much that is praiseworthy. I must conclude this letter abruptly, as the horses are waiting, and I must cross the rivers, if possible, before the bursting of an impending storm. I. L. B. End of section 48「Section 49 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan」by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 38. Sarufuto, Yezo, August 27. I left the Ainos yesterday with real regret, though I must confess that sleeping in one's clothes and the lack of ablutions are very fatiguing. Benri's two wives spent the early morning in the laborious operation of grinding millet into coarse flour, and before I departed, as their custom is, they made a paste of it, rolled it with their unclean fingers into well-shaped cakes, 
boils them in the unwashed pot in which they make their stew of abominable things, and presented them to me on a lacquer tray. They were distressed that I did not eat their food, and a woman went to a village at some distance and brought me some venison fat as a delicacy. All those of whom I had seen much came to wish me good-bye, and they brought so many presents, including a fine bearskin, that I should have needed an additional horse to carry them had I accepted but one half. I rode twelve miles through the forest to Mombetsu, where I intended to spend Sunday, but I had the worst horse I ever rode, and we took five hours. The day was dull and sad, threatening a storm, and when we got out of the forest upon a sand hill covered with oak scrub, we encountered a most furious wind. Among the many views which I have seen, that is one to be remembered. Below lay a bleached and bare sand hill, with a few grey houses huddled in its miserable shelter, and a heaped-up shore of grey sand, on which a brown-grey sea was breaking with clash and boom in long, white, ragged lines, with all beyond a confusion of surf, surge, and mist, with driving brown clouds mingling sea and sky, and all between showing only in glimpses amidst scuds of sand. At a house in the scrub a number of men were drinking sake with much uproar, and a superb-looking Aino came out, staggered a few yards, and then fell backwards among the weeds, a picture of debasement. I forgot to tell you that before I left Biratori I inveighed to the assembled Ainos against the practice and consequences of sake drinking, and was met with the reply, We must drink to the gods, or we shall die. But Pipichari said, You say that which is good. Let us give sake to the gods, but not drink it. For which bold speech he was severely rebuked by Benri. Mombetsu is a stormily situated and most wretched cluster of twenty-seven decayed houses, some of them Aino and some Japanese. The fish oil and seaweed fishing trades are in brisk operation there now for a short time, and a number of Aino and Japanese strangers are employed. The boats could not get out because of the surf, and there was a drunken debauch. The whole place smelt of sake. Tipsy men were staggering about and falling flat on their backs to lie there like dogs till they were sober. I know women were vainly endeavouring to drag their drunken lords home, and men of both races were reduced to a beastly equality. I went to the Yadoya where I intended to spend Sunday, but, besides being very dirty and forlorn, it was the very centre of the sake traffic, and in its open space there were men in all stages of riotous and stupid intoxication. It was a sad scene, yet one to be matched in a hundred places in Scotland every Saturday afternoon. I am told by the Kocho here that an Aino can drink four or five times as much as a Japanese without being tipsy, so for each tipsy Aino there had been an outlay of six shillings or seven shillings, for sake is eight pence a cup here. I had some tea and eggs in the Daidokoro, and altered my plans altogether on finding that if I proceeded farther round the east coast, as I intended, I should run the risk of several days' detention on the banks of numerous bad rivers, if rain came on, by which I should run the risk of breaking my promise to deliver Ito to Mr. Mary's by a given day. I do not surrender this project, however, without an equivalent, for I intend to add one hundred miles to my journey by taking an almost disused track round Volcano Bay and visiting the coast Ainos of a very primitive region. Ito is very much opposed to this, thinking that he has made a sufficient sacrifice of personal comfort at Biratori and plies me with stories, such as that there are many bad rivers to cross, that the track is so worn as to be impassable, that there are no yadoyas, and that at the government offices we shall neither get rice nor eggs. An old man who has turned back unable to get horses is made responsible for these stories. The machinations are very amusing. Ito was much smitten with the daughter of the housemaster at Mururan, and left some things in her keeping, and the desire to see her again is at the bottom of his opposition to the other route. 
Monday. The horse could not or would not carry me farther than Mombetsu, so, sending the baggage on, I walked through the oak wood and enjoyed its silent solitude, in spite of the sad reflections upon the enslavement of the Ainos to sake. I spent yesterday quietly in my old quarters, with a fearful storm of wind and rain outside. Pipichari appeared at noon, nominally to bring news of the sick woman, who is recovering, and to have his nearly healed foot bandaged again, but really to bring me a knife sheath which he has carved for me. He lay on the mat in the corner of my room most of the afternoon, and I got a great many more words from him. The housemaster, who is the cocho of Sarufuto, paid me a courteous visit, and in the evening sent to say that he would be very glad of some medicine, for he was very ill and going to have fever. He had caught a bad cold and sore throat, had bad pains in his limbs, and was bemoaning himself ruefully. To pacify his wife, who was very sorry for him, I gave him some cockles pills, and the trapper's remedy of a pint of hot water with a pinch of cayenne pepper, and left him moaning and bundled up under a pile of futons, in a nearly hermetically sealed room, with a hibachi of charcoal vitiating the air. This morning, when I went and inquired after him in a properly concerned tone, his wife told me very gleefully that he was quite well and had gone out, and had left twenty-five sen for some more of the medicines that I have given him. So, with great gravity, I put up some of Duncan and Flockhart's most pungent cayenne pepper, and showed her how much to use. She was not content, however, without some of the cockles, a single box of which has performed six of those miraculous cures, which rejoice the hearts and fill the pockets of patent medicine makers. I. L. B. End of section forty nine. Section fifty of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 39, Part 1. Old Mororan, Volcano Bay, Yezo, September 2nd. After the storm on Sunday, Monday was a grey, still, tender day, and the ranges of wooded hills were bathed in the richest indigo colouring. A canter of seventeen miles among the damask roses on a very rough horse only took me to Yubetsu, whose indescribable loneliness fascinated me into spending a night there again, and encountering a wild clatter of wind and rain. And another canter of seven miles the next morning took me to Tomakomai, where I rejoined my kuruma, and, after a long delay, three trotting Ainos took me to Shiraoi, where the clear shining after rain and the mountains against the lemon-coloured sky were extremely beautiful. But the Pacific was as unrestful as a guilty thing, and its crash and clamour and the severe cold fatigued me so much that I did not pursue my journey the next day, and had the pleasure of a flying visit from Mr. von Siebold and Count Diesbach, who bestowed a chicken upon me. I like Shiraoi very much, and if I were stronger, would certainly make it a basis for exploring a part of the interior, in which there is much to reward the explorer. Obviously the changes in this part of Yezo have been comparatively recent, and the energy of the force which has produced them is not yet extinct. The land has gained from the sea, along the whole of this part of the coast, to the extent of two or three miles, the old beach with its bays and headlands being a marked feature of the landscape. This new formation appears to be a vast bed of pumice, covered by a thin layer of vegetable mould, which cannot be more than fifty years old. This pumice fell during the eruption of the volcano of Tarumai, which is very near Shiraoi, and is also brought down in large quantities from the interior hills and valleys by the numerous rivers, besides being washed up by the sea. At the last eruption, pumice fell over this region of Yezo to a medium depth of three feet six inches. In nearly all the rivers good sections of the formation may be seen in their deeply cleft banks, 
broad, light-coloured bands of pumice, with a few inches of rich, black, vegetable soil above, and several feet of black sea sand below. During a freshet which occurred the first night I was at Shiraoi, a single stream covered a piece of land with pumice to the depth of nine inches, being the wash from the hills of the interior, in a course of less than fifteen miles. Looking inland, the volcano of Tarumai, with a bare grey top and a blasted forest on its sides, occupies the right of the picture. To the left and inland are mountains within mountains, tumbled together in most picturesque confusion, densely covered with forest and cleft by magnificent ravines, here and there opening out into narrow valleys. The whole of the interior is jungle, penetrable for a few miles by shallow and rapid rivers, and by nearly smothered trails made by the Ainos in search of game. The general lie of the country made me very anxious to find out whether a much broken ridge lying among the mountains is or is not a series of tufa cones of ancient date, and, applying for a good horse and Aino guide on horseback, I left Ito to amuse himself, and spent much of a splendid day in investigations, and in attempting to get round the back of the volcano and up its inland side. There is a great deal to see and learn here. Oh, that I had strength! After hours of most tedious and exhausting work, I reached a point where there were several great fissures emitting smoke and steam, with occasional subterranean detonations. These were on the side of a small, flank crack, which was smoking heavily. There was light pumice everywhere, but nothing like recent lava or scoriae. One fissure was completely lined with exquisite, acicular crystals of sulphur, which perished with a touch. Lower down there were two hot springs with a deposit of sulphur round their margins, and bubbles of gas, which, from its strong, garlicky smell, I suppose to be sulphuretted hydrogen. Farther progress in that direction was impossible without the force of pioneers. I put my arm down several deep crevices, which were at an altitude of only about five hundred feet, and had to withdraw it at once, owing to the great heat, in which some beautiful specimens of tropical ferns were growing. At the same height I came to a hot spring, hot enough to burst one of my thermometers, which was graduated above the boiling point of Fahrenheit, and, tying up an egg in a pocket handkerchief and holding it by a stick in the water, it was hard-boiled in eight and a half minutes. The water evaporated without leaving a trace of deposit on the handkerchief, and there was no crust round its margin. It boiled and bubbled with great force. Three hours more of exhausting toil, which almost knocked up the horses, brought us to the apparent ridge, and I was delighted to find that it consisted of a large lateral range of tufa cones, which I estimate as being from 200 to 350 or even 400 feet high. They are densely covered with trees of considerable age and the rich deposit of mould, but their conical form is still admirably defined. An hour of very severe work and energetic use of the knife on the part of the Aino took me to the top of one of these through a mass of entangled and gigantic vegetation, and I was amply repaid by finding a deep, well-defined crateriform cavity of great depth, with its side richly clothed with vegetation, closely resembling some of the old cones in the island of Kauai. This cone is partially girdled by a stream, which in one place has cut through a bank of both red and black volcanic ash. All the usual phenomena of volcanic regions are probably to be met with north of Shiraoi, and I hope they will at some future time be made the object of careful investigation. In spite of the desperate and almost overwhelming fatigue, I have enjoyed few things more than that exploring expedition. If the Japanese have no one to talk to, they croon hideous discords to themselves, and it was a relief to leave Ito behind and get away with an Aino who was at once silent, trustworthy and faithful. Two bright rivers bubbling over beds of red pebbles run down to Shiraoi out of the back country, and my directions, which were translated to the Aino, were to follow up one of these and go into the mountains in the direction of one I pointed out, till I said, 
Shiraoi. It was one of those exquisite mornings which are seen sometimes in the Scotch highlands before rain, with intense clearness and visibility, a blue atmosphere, a cloudless sky, blue summits, heavy dew, and glorious sunshine, and under these circumstances, scenery beautiful in itself became entrancing. The trailers are so formidable that we had to stoop over our horses' necks at all times, and with pushing back branches and guarding my face from slaps and scratches, my big dogskin gloves were literally frayed off, and some of the skin of my hands and face in addition, so that I returned with both bleeding and swelled. It wasn't the return ride, fortunately, that in stopping to escape one great liana, the loop of another grazed my nose, and, being unable to check my unbroken horse instantaneously, the loop caught me by the throat, nearly strangled me, and in less time than it takes to tell it, I was drawn over the back of the saddle and found myself lying on the ground, jammed between a tree and the hind leg of the horse, which was quietly feeding. The Aino, whose face was very badly scratched, missed me, came back, said never a word, helped me up, brought me some water in a leaf, brought my hat, and we rode on again. I was little the worse for the fall, but on borrowing a looking-glass I see not only scratches and abrasions all over my face, but a livid mark round my throat as if I had been hung. The Aino left portions of his bushy locks on many of the branches. You would have been amused to see me in this forest, preceded by this hairy and formidable-looking savage, who was dressed in a coat of skins with the fur outside, seated on the top of a pack-saddle covered with a deer-hide, and with his hairy legs crossed over the horse's neck, a fashion in which the Ainos ride any horses over any ground with the utmost serenity. It was a wonderful region for beauty. I have not seen so beautiful a view in Japan as from the riverbed from which I had the first near view of the grand assemblage of tufa cones, covered with an ancient vegetation, backed by high mountains of volcanic origin, on whose ragged crests the red ash was blazing vermilion against the blue sky, with a foreground of bright waters flashing through a primeval forest. The banks of these steams were deeply excavated by the heavy rains, and sometimes we had to jump three and even four feet out of the forest into the river, and as much up again, fording the Shiraoi River only more than twenty times, and often making a pathway of its treacherous bed and rushing waters, because the forest was impassable from the great size of the prostrate trees. The horses look at these jumps, hold back, try to turn, and then, making up their minds, suddenly plunge up or down. When the last vestige of a trail disappeared, I signed to the Aino to go on, and our subsequent exploration was all done at the rate of about a mile an hour. On the openings the grass grows stiff and strong to the height of eight feet, with its soft reddish plumes wazing in the breeze. The Aino first forced his horse through it, but of course it closed again, so that constantly when he was close in front, I was only aware of his proximity by the tinkling of his horse's bells, for I saw nothing of him or of my own horse, except the horn of my saddle. We tumbled into holes often, and as easily tumbled out of them, but once we both went down in the most unexpected manner into what must have been an old bear trap, both going over our horses' heads, the horses and ourselves struggling together in a narrow space in a mist of grassy plumes, and, being unable to communicate with my guide, the sense of the ridiculous situation was so overpowering that, even in the midst of the mishap, I was exhausted with laughter, though not a little bruised. It was very hard to get out of that pitfall, and I hope I shall never get into one again. It is not the first occasion on which I have been glad that the Yezo horses are shoeless. It was through this long grass that we fought our way to the tufa cones, with the red ragged crests against the blue sky. The scenery was magnificent, and after getting so far I longed to explore the sources of the rivers, but besides the many difficulties the day was far spent. 
I was also too weak for any energetic undertaking, yet I felt an intuitive perception of the passion and fascination of exploring, and understand how people could give up their lives to it. I turned away from the tufa cones and the glory of the ragged crests very sadly, to ride a tired horse through great difficulties, and the animal was so thoroughly done up that I had to walk, or rather wade, for the last hour, and it was nightfall when I returned. To find that Ito had packed up all my things, had been waiting ever since noon to start for Horobetsu, was very grumpy at having to unpack, and thoroughly disgusted when I told him that I was so tired and bruised that I should have to remain the next day to rest. He said indignantly, I never thought that when you'd got the Kataikushi Kuruma you'd go off the road into those woods. We had seen some deer and many pheasants, and a successful hunter brought in a fine stag, so that I had venison steak for supper, and was much comforted, though Ito seasoned the meal with well-got-up stories of the impracticability of the Volcano Bay route. Shiraoi consists of a large old honjin, or yadoya, where the daimyo and his train used to lodge in the old days, and about eleven Japanese houses, most of which are sake shops, a fact which supplies an explanation of the squalor of the Aino village of fifty-two houses, which is on the shore at a respectful distance. There is no cultivation, in which it is like all the fishing villages on this part of the coast, but fish oil and fish manure are made in immense quantities, and, though it is not the season here, the place is pervaded by an ancient and fish-like smell. The Aino houses are much smaller, poorer, and dirtier than those of Piratori. I went into a number of them and conversed with the people, many of whom understand Japanese. Some of the houses looked like dens, and, as it was raining, husband, wife, and five or six naked children, all as dirty as they could be, with unkempt, elf-like locks, were huddled round the fires. Still, bad as it looked and smelt, the fire was the hearth, and the hearth was inviolate, and each smoked and dirt-stained group was a family, and it was an advance upon the social life of, for instance, Salt Lake City. The roofs are much flatter than those of the mountain Ainos, and, as there are few storehouses, quantities of fish, green skins, and venison hang from the rafters, and the smell of these and the stinging of the smoke were most trying. Few of the houses had any guest seats, but in the very poorest, when I asked shelter from the rain, they put their best mat upon the ground, and insisted, much to my distress, on my walking over it in muddy boots, saying, It is I know custom. Ever in those squalid homes the broad shelf, with its rows of Japanese curious, always has a place. I mention that it is customary for a chief to appoint a successor when he becomes infirm, and I came upon a case in point, through a mistaken direction, which took us to the house of the former chief, with a great empty bear-cage at its door. On addressing him as the chief, he said, I am old and blind, I cannot go out, I am of no more good, and directed us to the house of his successor. Altogether, it is obvious, from many evidences in this village, that Japanese contiguity is hurtful, and that the Ainos have reaped abundantly of the disadvantages without the advantages of contact with Japanese civilization. That night I saw a specimen of Japanese horse-breaking as practiced in Yezo. A Japanese brought into the village street a handsome, spirited young horse, equipped with a Japanese demi peak saddle and a most cruel gag bit. The man wore very cruel spurs, and was armed with a bit of stout board two feet long by six inches broad. The horse had not been mounted before and was frightened, but not the least vicious. He was spurred into a gallop and ridden at full speed up and down the street, turned by main force, thrown on its haunches, guarded with the spurs, and cowed by being mercilessly thrashed over the ears and eyes with the piece of board till he was blinded with blood. 
whenever he tried to stop from exhaustion he was spurred jerked and flogged till at last covered with steam foam and blood and with blood running from his mouth and splashing the road he reeled staggered and fell the rider dexterously disengaging himself as soon as he was able to stand he was allowed to crawl into a shed where he was kept without food till morning when a child could do anything with him he was broken effectually spirit broken useless for the rest of his life it was a brutal and brutalizing exhibition as triumphs of brute force always are End of section 50section fifty one of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and twelve letter thirty nine part two this morning i left early in the kuruma with two kind and delightful savages the road being much broken by the rains i had to get out frequently and every time I got in again they put my air-pillow behind me and covered me up in a blanket, and when we got to a rough river one made a step of his back by which I mounted their horse, and gave me nooses of rope to hold on by, and the other held my arm to keep me steady, and they would not let me walk up or down any of the hills. What a blessing it is! that amidst the confusion of tongues the language of kindness and courtesy is universally understood, and that a kindly smile on a savage face is as intelligible as on that of one's own countrymen. They had never drawn a kuruma, and were as pleased as children when I showed them how to balance the shafts. They were not without the capacity to originate ideas, for, when they were tired of the frolic of pulling, they attached the kuruma by ropes to the horse, which one of them rode at a scramble, while the other merely ran in the shafts to keep them level. This is an excellent plan. Horobetsu is a fishing station of antique and decayed aspect, with 18 Japanese and 47 Aino houses. The latter are much larger than at Shiraoi, and their very steep roofs are beautifully constructed. It was a miserable day, with fog concealing the mountains and lying heavily on the sea, but as no one expected rain I sent the kuruma back to Mororan and secured horses. On principle I always go to the coral myself, to choose animals, if possible, without sore backs, but the choice is often between one with a mere raw and others which have holes in their backs into which I could put my hand, or altogether uncovered spines. The practice does no immediate good, but by showing the Japanese that foreign opinion condemns these cruelties, an amendment may eventually be brought about. At Horobetsu, among twenty horses, there was not one that I would take. I should like to have had them all shot. They are cheap and abundant, and are of no account. They drove a number more down from the hills, and I chose the largest and finest horse I have seen in Japan, with some spirit and action, but I soon found that he had tender feet. We shortly left the high road, and in torrents of rain turned off on unbeaten tracks, which led us through a very bad swamp and some much swollen and very rough rivers into the mountains, where we followed a worn-out track for eight miles. It was literally foul weather, dark and still, with a brown mist and rain falling in sheets. I threw my paper waterproof away as useless, my clothes were of course soaked, and it was with much difficulty that I kept my shomon and paper money from being reduced to pulp. Typhoons are not known so far north as Yezo, but it was what they call a typhoon rain without the typhoon, and in no time it turned the streams into torrents barely fordable, and tore up such of a road as there is, which has its best as a mere water channel. Torrents, bringing down tolerable-sized stones, tore down the track, and when the horses had been struck two or three times by these, it was with difficulty that they could be induced to face the rushing water. 
constantly in a pass the water had gradually cut a track several feet deep between steep banks and the only possible walking place was a stony gash not wide enough for the two feet of a horse alongside of each other down which water and stones were rushing from behind with all manner of trailers matted overhead and between avoiding being strangled and attempting to keep a tender-footed horse on his legs the ride was a very severe one the poor animal fell five times from stepping on stones and in one of his falls twisted my left wrist badly i thought of the many people who envied me my tour in japan and wondered whether they would envy me that ride after this had gone on for four hours the track with a sudden dip over a hillside came down on old mororan a village of thirty aino and nine japanese houses very unpromising looking although exquisitely situated on the rim of a lovely cove the aino huts were small and poor with an unusual number of bear skulls on poles and the village consisted mainly of two long dilapidated buildings in which a number of men were mending nets it looked a decaying place of low mean lives but at a merchant's there was one delightful room with two translucent sides one opening on the village the other looking to the sea down a short steep slope on which is a quaint little garden with dwarfed fir trees in pots a few balsams and the red cabbage grown with much pride as a foliage plant it is nearly midnight but my bed and bedding are so wet that i am still sitting up and drying them patch by patch with tedious slowness on a wooden frame placed over a charcoal brazier which has given my room the dryness and warmth which are needed when a person has been for many hours in soaked clothing and has nothing really dry to put on ito bought a chicken for my supper but when he was going to kill it an hour later its owner in much grief returned the money saying she had brought it up and could not bear to see it killed this is a wild outlandish place but an intuition tells me that it is beautiful the ocean at present is thundering up the beach with the sullen force of a heavy ground swell and the rain is still falling in torrents i alby end of section 51section fifty two of unbeaten tracks in japan by isabella l bird this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by avai in october two thousand and twelve letter forty part one lebunge volcano bay yezo september six weary wave and dying blast sob and moan along the shore all is peace at last and more than peace it was a heavenly morning the deep blue sky was perfectly unclouded a blue sea with diamond flash and a many twinkling smile rippled gently on the golden sands of the lovely little bay and opposite forty miles away the pink summit of the volcano of komonotaki forming the southwestern point of volcano bay rose into a softening veil of tender blue haze there was a balmy breeziness in the air and tawny tints upon the hill patches of gold in the wood and the scarlet spray here and there heralded the glories of the advancing autumn as the day began so it closed i should like to have detained each hour as it passed it was thorough enjoyment i visited a good many of the mororan ainos saw their well-grown bear in its cage and tearing myself away with difficulty at noon crossed a steep hill and a wood of scrub oak and then followed a trail which runs on the amber sands close to the sea crosses several small streams and passes the lonely aino village of maripu the ocean always on the left and wooded ranges on the right and in front an apparent bar to farther progress in the volcano of Uzutaki, an imposing mountain rising abruptly to a height of nearly three thousand feet i should think in yezo as on the main island one can learn very little about any prospective route 
Usually, when one makes an inquiry, a Japanese puts on a stupid look, giggles, tucks his thumbs into his girdle, hitches up his garments, and either professes perfect ignorance or gives one some vague second-hand information, though it is quite possible that he may have been over every foot of the ground himself more than once. Whether suspicion of your motives in asking, or a fear of compromising himself by answering, is at the bottom of this, I don't know, but it is most exasperating to a traveller. In Hakodate I failed to see Captain Blackiston, who has walked round the whole Yezo seaboard, and all I was able to learn regarding this route was that the coast was thinly peopled by Ainos, that there were government horses which could be got, and that one could sleep where one got them, that rice and salt fish were the only food, that there were many bad rivers, and that the road went over bad mountains, that the only people who went that way were government officials twice a year, that one could not get on more than four miles a day, that the roads over the passes were all big stones, etc., etc. So this Uzutaki took me altogether by surprise, and for a time confounded all my carefully constructed notions of locality. I had been told that the one volcano in the bay was Komonotaki, near Mori, and this I believed to be eighty miles off, and there, confronting me, within a distance of two miles, was this grand, splintered, vermilion-crested thing, with a far nobler aspect than that of THE volcano, with a curtain range in front, deeply scored, and slashed with ravines and abysses whose purple gloom was unlighted even by the noonday sun. One of the peaks was emitting black smoke from a deep crater, another steam and white smoke from various rents and fissures in its side, vermilion peaks, smoke and steam all rising into a sky of brilliant blue, and the atmosphere was so clear that I saw everything that was going on there quite distinctly, especially when I attained an altitude exceeding that of the curtain range. It was not for two days that I got a correct idea of its geographical situation, but I was not long in finding out that it was not Komonotaki. There is much volcanic activity about it. I saw a glare from it last night thirty miles away. The Ainos said that it was a god, but did not know its name, nor did the Japanese who were living under its shadow. At some distance from it in the interior rises a grand dome-like mountain, Shiribetsan, and the whole view is grand. A little beyond Mombetsu flows the river Osharu, one of the largest of the Yezo streams. It was much swollen by the previous day's rain, and as the ferry boat was carried away, we had to swim it, and the swim seemed very long. Of course, we and the baggage got very wet. The coolness with which the Aino guide took to the water without giving us any notice that its broad eddying flood was a swim and not a ford was very amusing. From the top of a steepish ascent beyond the Osharugawa, there is a view into what looks like a very lovely lake, with wooded promontories and little bays and rocky capes in miniature, and little heights, on which Aino houses with tawny roofs are clustered, and then the track dips suddenly and deposits one, not by a lake at all, but on Uzu Bay, an inlet to the Pacific, much broken up into coves, and with a very narrow entrance, only obvious from a few points. Just as the track touches the bay, there is a road post with a prayer wheel in it, and by the shore an upright stone of very large size, inscribed with Sanskrit characters, near to a stone staircase and a gateway in a massive stone-faced embankment, which looked much out of keeping with the general wildness of the place. On a rocky promontory in a wooded cove there is a large, rambling house, greatly out of repair, inhabited by a Japanese man and his son, who are placed there to look after government interests, exiles among five hundred Ainos. From among the number of red-haunted, rambling rooms which had once been handsome, I chose one opening on a yard or garden with some distorted use in it, but found that the great gateway and the amado had no bolts, 
and that anything might be appropriated by any one with dishonest intentions. But the housemaster and his son, who have lived for ten years among the Ainos and speak their language, say that nothing is ever taken, and that the Ainos are thoroughly honest and harmless. Without this assurance I should have been distrustful of the number of white-mouthed youths who hung about in the listlessness and vacuity of savagery, if not of the bearded men who sat or stood about the gateway with children in their arms. Uzu is a dream of beauty and peace. There is not much difference between the height of high and low water on this coast, and the lake-like illusion would have been perfect had it not been that the rocks were tinged with gold for a foot or so above the sea by a delicate species of fucus. In the exquisite inlet where I spent the nights, trees and trailers drooped into the water and were mirrored in it, their green, heavy shadows lying sharp against the sunset gold and pink of the rest of the bay. Log canoes, with planks laced upon their gunwales to heighten them, were drawn upon a tiny beach of golden sand, and in the shadiest cove, moored to a tree, an antique and much-carved junk was floating double. Wooded rocky knolls with Aino huts, the vermilion peaks of the volcano of Uzutaki redder than ever in the sinking sun, a few Ainos mending their nets, a few more spreading edible seaweed out to dry, a single canoe breaking the golden mirror of the cove by its noiseless motion, a few Aino loungers with their mild-eyed melancholy faces and quiet ways suiting the quiet evening scene, the unearthly sweetness of a temple bell. This was all, and yet it was the loveliest picture I have seen in Japan. In spite of Ito's remonstrances and his protestations that an exceptionally good supper would be spoiled, I left my red-haunted room, with its tarnished gilding and precarious fusuma, to get the last of the pink and lemon-coloured glory, going up the staircase in the stone-faced embankment, and up a broad, well-paved avenue to a large temple, within whose open door I sat for some time absolutely alone and in wonderful stillness, for the sweet-toned bell, which vainly chimes for vespers amidst this bare worshipping population, had ceased. This temple was the first symptom of Japanese religion that I remember to have seen since leaving Hakodate, and worshippers have long since ebbed away from its shady and moss-grown courts. Yet it stands there to protest for the teaching of the great Hindu, and generations of Aino heathen pass away one after another, and still its bronze bell tolls, and its altar lamps are lit, and incense burns forever before Buddha. The characters on the great bell of this temple are said to be the same lines which are often graven on temple bells, and to possess the dignity of twenty-four centuries. All things are transient, they being born must die, and being born are dead, and being dead are glad to be at rest. The temple is very handsome, the baldachino is superb, and the bronzes and brasses on the altar are specially fine. A broad ray of sunlight streamed in, crossed the matted floor, and fell full upon the figure of Sakyamuni in his golden shrine, and just at that moment a shaven priest in silk brocaded vestments of faded green silently passed down the stream of light and lit the candles on the altar and fresh incense filled the temple with a drowsy fragrance. It was a most impressive picture. His curiosity evidently shortened his devotions, and he came and asked me where I had been and where I was going, to which, of course, I replied in excellent Japanese, and then stuck fast. Along the paved avenue, besides the usual stone trough for holy water, there are on one side the thousand-armed Kwanon, a very fine relief, and on the other a Buddha throned on the eternal lotus blossom with an iron staff, much resembling a crozier in his hand, and that eternal apathy on his face which is the highest hope of those who hope at all. I went through a wood where there are some mournful groups of graves on the hillside, 
and from the temple came the sweet sound of the great bronze bell and the beat of the big drum and then more faintly the sound of the little bell and drum with which the priest accompanies his ceaseless repetition of a phrase in the dead tongue of a distant land there is an infinite pathos about the lonely temple in its splendour the absence of even possible worshippers and the large population of ainos sunk in yet deeper superstitions than those which go to make up popular buddhism i sat on a rock by the bay till the last pink glow faded from uzutaki and the last lemon stain from the still water and a beautiful crescent which hung over the wooded hill had set and the heavens blazed with stars Ten thousand stars were in the sky, ten thousand in the sea, and every wave with dimpled face that leapt upon the air had caught a star in its embrace and held it trembling there. The loneliness of Uzu Bay is something wonderful, a house full of empty rooms falling to decay with only two men in it, one Japanese house among five hundred savages, yet it was the only one in which i have slept in which they bolted neither the amado nor the gate during the night the amado fell out of the worn-out grooves with a crash knocking down the shoji which fell on me and rousing ito who rushed into my room half asleep with a vague vision of bloodthirsty ainos in his mind i then learnt what i have been very stupid not to have learnt before that in these sliding wooden shutters there is a small door through which one person can creep at a time called the jishindo or earthquake door because it provides an exit during the alarm of an earthquake in case of the amado sticking in their grooves or the bolts going wrong i believe that such a door exists in all japanese houses the next morning was as beautiful as the previous evening rose and gold instead of gold and pink. Before the sun was well up, I visited a number of the Aino lodges, saw the bear and the chief, who, like all the rest, is a monogamist, and, after breakfast, at my request, some of the old men came to give me such information as they had. These venerable elders sat cross-legged in the veranda, the housemaster's son, who kindly acted as interpreter, squatting japanese fashion at the side and about thirty ainos mostly women with infants sitting behind i spent about two hours in going over the same ground as at biratori and also went over the words and got some more including some synonyms the click of the ts before the ch at the beginning of a word is strongly marked among these ainos some of their customs differ slightly from those of their brethren of the interior especially as to the period of seclusion after a death the non-allowance of polygamy to the chief and the manner of killing the bear at the annual festival their ideas of metempsychosis are more definite but this i think is to be accounted for by the influence and proximity of buddhism they spoke of the bear as their chief god and next the sun and fire they said that they no longer worship the wolf and that though they call the volcano and many other things kamoi or god they do not worship them i ascertained beyond doubt that worship with them means simply making libations of sake and drinking to the god and that it is unaccompanied by petitions or any vocal or mental act these ainos are as dark as the people of southern spain and very hairy their expression is earnest and pathetic and when they smiled as they did when i could not pronounce their words their faces had a touching sweetness which was quite beautiful and european not asiatic their own impression is that they are now increasing in numbers after diminishing for many years i left uzu sleeping in the loveliness of an autumn noon with great regret no place that I have seen has fascinated me so much. End of section 52。section 53 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird。
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 40, Part 2. A charge of three sen per ri more for the horses for the next stage, because there were such bad mountains to cross, prepared me for what followed, many miles of the worst road for horses I ever saw. I should not have complained if they had charged double the price. As an almost certain consequence, it was one of the most picturesque routes I have ever travelled. For some distance, however, it runs placidly along by the seashore, on which big, blue, foam-crested rollers were disporting themselves noisily, and passes through several Aino hamlets, and the Aino village of Abuta, with sixty houses, rather a prosperous-looking place, where the cultivation was considerably more careful, and the people possessed a number of horses. Several of the houses were surrounded by bears' skulls, grinning from between the forked tops of high poles, and there was a well-grown bear ready for his doom and apotheosis. In nearly all the houses a woman was weaving bark cloth, with the hook which holds the web fixed into the ground several feet outside the house. At a deep river called the Nopokobetsu, which emerges from the mountains close to the sea, we were ferried by an Aino completely covered with hair, which on his shoulders was wavy like that of a retriever, and rendered clothing quite needless neither for covering or warmth. A wavy black beard rippled nearly to his waist over his furry chest, and, with his black locks hanging in masses over his shoulders, he would have looked a thorough savage had it not been for the exceeding sweetness of his smile and eyes. The Volcano Bay Ainos are far more hairy than the mountain Ainos, but even among them it is quite common to see men not more so than vigorous Europeans, and I think that the hairiness of the race as a distinctive feature has been much exaggerated, partly by the smooth-skinned Japanese. The fairy scow was nearly upset by our four horses beginning to fight. At first one bit the shoulders of another, then the one attacked uttered sharp, sharp squeals, and returned the attack by striking with his forefeet, and then there was a general melee of striking and biting, till some ugly wounds were inflicted. I have watched fights of this kind on a large scale every day in the coral. The miseries of the Yezo horses are the great drawback of Yezo travelling. They are brutally used, and are covered with awful wounds from being driven at a fast scramble, with the rude, ungirthed pack-saddle and its heavy load rolling about on their backs, and they are beaten unmercifully over their eyes and ears with heavy sticks. Ito has been barbarous to these gentle, little-prized animals ever since we came to Yezo. He has vexed me more by this than by anything else, especially as he never dared even to carry a switch on the main island, either from fear of the horses or their owners. Today he was beating the baggage horse unmercifully, when I rode back and interfered with some very strong language, saying, You are a bully, and, like all bullies, a coward. Imagine my aggravation when, at our first halt, he brought out his notebook, as usual, and quietly asked me the meaning of the words bully and coward. It was perfectly impossible to explain them, so I said a bully was the worst name I could call him, and that a coward was the meanest thing a man could be. Then the provoked boy said, Is bully a worse name than devil? Yes, far worse. I said, on which he seemed rather crestfallen, and he has not beaten his horse since, in my sight at least. The breaking in process is simply breaking the spirit, by an hour or two of such atrocious cruelty as I saw at Shiraoi, at the end of which the horse, covered with foam and blood, and bleeding from mouth and nose, falls down exhausted. Being so ill-used, they have all kinds of tricks, such as lying down in fords, throwing themselves down head foremost and rolling over pack and rider, bucking and resisting attempts to make them go otherwise than in single file. Instead of bits, they have bars of wood on each side of the mouth, secured by a rope through the nose and chin. 
when horses which have been broken with bits gallop they put up their heads till the nose is level with the ears and it is useless to try either to guide or check them they are always wanting to join the great herds on the hillside or seashore from which they are only driven down as they are needed in every Yezo village the first sound that one hears at break of day is the gallop of forty or fifty horses, pursued by an Aino, who has hunted them from the hills. A horse is worth from twenty-eight shillings upwards. They are very sure-footed when their feet are not sore, and cross a stream or chasm on a single rickety plank, or walk on a narrow ledge above a river or gulch without fear. They are barefooted, their hoofs are very hard, and I am glad to be rid of the perpetual tying and untying and replacing of the straw shoes of the well-cared-for horses of the main island. A man rides with them, and for a man and three horses the charge is only sixpence for each two and a half miles. I am now making Ito ride in front of me, to make sure that he does not beat or otherwise misuse his beast. After crossing the Nopkobetsu, from which the fighting horses have led me to make so long a digression, we went right up into the bad mountains and crossed the three tremendous passes of Lebungetoge. Except by saying that this disused bridle track is impassable, people have scarcely exaggerated its difficulties. One horse broke down on the first pass, and we were long delayed by sending the Aino back for another. Possibly these extraordinary passes do not exceed 1,500 feet in height, but the track ascends them through a dense forest with most extraordinary abruptness, to descend as abruptly, to rise again sometimes by a series of nearly washed-away zigzags, at others by a straight, ladder-like ascent deeply channeled, the bottom of the trough being filled with rough stones, large and small, or with ledges of rock with an entangled mass of branches and trailers overhead, which render it necessary to stoop over the horse's head while he is either fumbling, stumbling, or tumbling among the stones in a gash a foot wide, or else is awkwardly leaping up broken rock steps nearly the height of his chest, the whole performance consisting of a series of scrambling jerks at the rate of a mile an hour. In one of the worst places, the Aino's horse, which was just in front of mine, in trying to scramble up a nearly breast-high and much-worn ledge, fell backwards, nearly overturning my horse, the stretcher-poles, which formed part of his pack, striking me so hard above my ankle that for some minutes afterwards I thought the bone was broken. The ankle was severely cut and bruised and bled a good deal, and I was knocked out of the saddle. Ito's horse fell three times, and eventually the four were roped together. Such are some of the divertisements of Yezo travel. Ah, but it was glorious! The views are most magnificent. This is really paradise. Everything is here, huge headlands magnificently timbered, small deep bays into which the great green waves roll majestically, great grey cliffs, too perpendicular for even the most adventurous trailer to find root hold, bold bluffs and outlying stacks set are crested, glimpses of bright blue ocean dimpling in the sunshine or tossing up wreaths of foam among ferns and trailers, and inland ranges of mountains, forest covered with tremendous gorges between, forest filled, where wolf, bear, and deer make their nearly inaccessible lairs, and outlying battlements, and ridges of grey rock with hardly six feet of level on their sinuous tops, and cedars in masses giving deep shadow, and sprays of scarlet maple or festoons of a crimson wine lightening the gloom. The inland view suggested infinity. There seemed no limit to the forest-covered mountains and the unlighted ravines. The wealth of vegetation was equal in luxuriance and entanglement to that of the tropics, primeval vegetation on which the lumberous axe has never rung. Trees of immense height and girth, especially the beautiful Salisburia adiantifolia, with its small fan-shaped leaves, 
all matted together by riotous lianas, rise out of an impenetrable undergrowth of the dwarf, dark-leaved bamboo, which, dwarf as it is, attains a height of seven feet, and all is dark, solemn, soundless, the haunt of wild beasts, and of butterflies and dragonflies of the most brilliant colours. There was light without heat, leaves and streams sparkled, and there was nothing of the half-smothered sensation which is often produced by the choking greenery of the main island, for frequently, far below, the Pacific flashed in all its sunlit beauty, and occasionally we came down unexpectedly on a little cove with abrupt cedar-crested headlands and stacks, and a heavy surf rolling in with the deep thunder music which alone breaks the stillness of this silent land. There was one tremendous declivity where I got off to walk, but found it too steep to descend on foot with comfort. You can imagine how steep it was when I tell you that the deep groove being too narrow for me to get to the side of my horse, I dropped down upon him from behind, between his tail and the saddle, and so scrambled on. The sun had set, and the dew was falling heavily when the track dipped over the brow of a headland, becoming a waterway so steep and rough that I could not get down it on foot without the assistance of my hands, and terminating on a lonely little bay of great beauty, walled in by impracticable-looking headlands, which was the entrance to an equally impracticable-looking, densely wooded valley running up among densely wooded mountains. There was a margin of grey sand above the sea, and on this the skeleton of an enormous whale was bleaching. Two or three large dugouts, with planks laced with stout fibre on their gunwales, and some bleached driftwood lay on the beach, the foreground of a solitary, rambling, dilapidated grey house, bleached like all else, where three Japanese men with an old Aino servant live, to look after government interests, whatever these may be, and keep rooms and horses for government officials, a great boon to travellers who, like me, are belated here. Only one person has passed Le Bunge this year, except two officials and a policeman. There was still a red glow on the water, and one horn of a young moon appeared above the wooded headland, but the loneliness and isolation are overpowering, and it is enough to produce madness to be shut in forever with the thunder of the everlasting surf, which compels one to raise one's voice in order to be heard. In the wood, half a mile from the sea, there is an Aino village of thirty houses, and the appearance of a few of the savages gliding noiselessly over the beach in the twilight added to the ghastliness and loneliness of the scene. The horses were unloaded by the time I arrived, and several courteous Ainos showed me to my room, opening on a small courtyard with a heavy gate. The room was musty, and, being rarely used, swarmed with spiders. A saucer of fish oil and a wick rendered darkness visible, and showed faintly the dark, pathetic faces of a row of Ainos in the veranda, who retired noiselessly with their graceful salutation when I bade them good night. Food was hardly to be expected, yet they gave me rice, potatoes, and black beans boiled in equal parts of brine and syrup, which are very palatable. The cuts and bruises of yesterday became so very painful with the cold of the early morning that I have been obliged to remain here. I. L. B. End of section 53。section 54 of unbeaten tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird。this librivox recording is in the public domain。recording by Avayi in October 2012。letter 41。Hakodate September 12。Le Bunge is a much fascinating place in its awful isolation. The housemaster was a friendly man and much attached to the Ainos. If other officials entrusted with Aino concerns treat the Ainos as fraternally as those of Uzu and Le Bunge, there is not much to lament. This man also gave them a high character for honesty and harmlessness, 
and asked if they might come and see me before I left. So twenty men, mostly carrying very pretty children, came into the yard with the horses. They had never seen a foreigner, but, either from apathy or politeness, they neither stare nor press upon one as the Japanese do, and always make a courteous recognition. The bearskin housing of my saddle pleased them very much, and my boots of unblacked leather, which they compared to the deer-hide moccasins which they were for winter hunting. Their voices were the lowest and most musical that I have heard, incongruous sounds to proceed from such hairy, powerful-looking men. Their love for their children was most marked. They caressed them tenderly and held them aloft for notice, and when the housemaster told them how much I admired the brown, dark-eyed, winsome creatures, their faces lighted with pleasure, and they saluted me over and over again. These, like other Ainos, utter a short screeching sound when they are not pleased, and then one recognizes the savage. These Lebunge Ainos differ considerably from those of the eastern villages, and I have again to notice the decided sound or click of the T-S at the beginning of many words. Their skins are as swarthy as those of Bedouin, their foreheads comparatively low, their eyes far more deeply set, their stature lower, their hair yet more abundant, the look of wistful melancholy more marked, and two, who were unclothed for hard work in fashioning a canoe, were almost entirely covered with short black hair, specially thick on the shoulders and back, and so completely concealing the skin as to reconcile one to the lack of clothing. I noticed an enormous breadth of chest and a great development of the muscles of the arms and legs. All these Ainos shave their hair off for two inches above their brows, only allowing it there to attain the length of an inch. Among the well-clothed Ainos in the yard there was one smooth face, smooth-skinned, concave-chested, spindle-limbed, yellow Japanese, with no other clothing than the decorated bark cloth apron which the Ainos wear in addition to their coats and leggings. Escorted by these gentle, friendly savages, I visited their lodges, which are very small and poor, and in every way inferior to those of the mountain Ainos. Their women are short and thick-set, and most uncomely. From their village I started for the longest, and by reputation the worst, stage of my journey, seventeen miles, the first ten of which are over mountains. So solitary and disused is this track, that on a four days' journey we have not met a human being. In the Lebunge Valley, which is densely forested, and abounds with fordable streams and treacherous ground, I came upon a grand specimen of the Salisburia adiantifolia, which, at a height of three feet from the ground, divides into eight lofty stems, none of them less than two feet five inches in diameter. This tree, which grows rapidly, is so well adapted to our climate that I wonder it has not been introduced on a large scale, as it may be seen by everybody in Kew Gardens. There is another tree with orbicular leaves in pairs, which grows to an immense size. From this valley a worn-out, stony bridle track ascends the western side of Lebunge Toge, climbing through a dense forest of trees and trailers, to a height of about two thousand feet, where, contended with its efforts, it reposes, and, with only slight up and downs, continues along the top of a narrow ridge within the seaward mountains, between high walls of dense bamboo, which, for much of that day's journey, is the undergrowth alike of mountain and valley, ragged peak and rugged ravine. The scenery was as magnificent as on the previous day. A guide was absolutely needed, as the track ceased altogether in one place, and for some time the horses had to blunder their way along a bright, rushing river, swirling rapidly downwards, heavily bordered with bamboo, full of deep holes, and made difficult by trees which have fallen across it. There Ito, whose horse could not keep up with the others, was lost, or rather lost himself, which led to a delay of two hours. I have never seen grander forest than on that two days' ride. 
at last the track barely passable after its recovery dips over a precipitous bluff and descends close to the sea which has evidently receded considerably thence it runs for six miles on a level sandy strip covered near the sea with a dwarf bamboo about five inches high and farther inland with red roses and blue campanula at the foot of the bluff there is a ruinous japanese house where an aino family has been placed to give shelter and rest to any who may be crossing the pass i opened my bento bako of red lacquer and found that it contained some cold waxy potatoes on which i dined with the addition of some tea and then waited wearily for ito for whom the guide went in search the house and its inmates were a study the ceiling was gone and all kinds of things for which i could not imagine any possible use hung from the blackened rafters everything was broken and decayed and the dirt was appalling a very ugly aino woman hardly human in her ugliness was splitting bark fiber there were several irori japanese fashion and at one of them a grand-looking old man was seated apathetically contemplating the boiling of a pot old and sitting among ruins he represented the fate of a race which living has no history and perishing leaves no monument by the other irori sat or rather crouched the missing link i was startled when i first saw it it was shall i say a man and the maid i cannot write the husband of the ugly woman it was about fifty the lofty aino brow had been made still loftier by shaving the head for three inches above it the hair hung not in shocks but in snaky wisps mingling with a beard which was grey and matted the eyes were dark but vacant and the face had no other expression than that look of apathetic melancholy which one sometimes sees on the faces of captive beasts the arms and legs were unnaturally long and thin and the creature sat with the knees tucked into the armpits the limbs and body with the exception of a patch on each side were thinly covered with fine black hair more than an inch long which was slightly curly on the shoulders it showed no other sign of intelligence than that evidenced by boiling water for my tea when ito arrived he looked at it with disgust exclaiming the ainos are just dogs they had a dog for their father in allusion to their own legend of their origin the level was pleasant after the mountains and a canter took us pleasantly to oshamambe where we struck the old road from mori to satsuporo and where i halted for a day to rest my spine from which i was suffering much oshamambe looks dismal even in the sunshine decayed and dissipated with many people lounging about it doing nothing with the dazed look which overindulgence in sake gives to the eyes the sun was scorching hot and i was glad to find refuge from it in a crowded and dilapidated yadoya where there were no black beans and the use of eggs did not appear to be recognized my room was only enclosed by shoji and there were scarcely five minutes of the day in which eyes were not applied to the finger holes with which they were liberally riddled and during the night one of them fell down revealing six japanese sleeping in a row each head on a wooden pillow the grandeur of the route ceased with the mountain passes but in the brilliant sunshine the ride from oshamambe to mori which took me two days was as pretty and pleasant as it could be at first we got on very slowly as besides my four horses there were four led ones going home which got up fights and entangled their ropes and occasionally lay down and rolled and besides these there were three foals following their mothers and if they stayed behind the mares hung back neighing and if they frolicked ahead the mares wanted to look after them and the whole string showed a combined inclination to dispense with their riders and join the many herds of horses which we passed it was so tedious that after enduring it for some time i got ito's horse and mine into a scow at a river of some size and left the disorderly drove to follow at leisure 
At Yurappu, where there is an Aino village of thirty houses, we saw the last of the Aborigines, and the interest of the journey ended. Strips of hard sand below a high water mark, strips of red roses, ranges of wooded mountains, rivers deep and shallow, a few villages of old grey houses amidst grey sand and bleaching driftwood, and then came the river Yurappu, a broad deep stream, navigable in a canoe for fourteen miles. The scenery there was truly beautiful in the late and splendid afternoon. The long blue waves rolled on shore, each one crested with light as it curled before it broke, and hurled its snowy drift for miles along the coast with a deep booming music. The glorious inland view was composed of six ranges of forest-covered mountains, broken, chasmed, caverned, and dark with timber, and above them bald grey peaks rose against the green sky of singular purity. I longed to take a boat up the Yurappu, which penetrates by many a gorge into their solemn recesses, but had no strength to carry my wish. After this I exchanged a silence, or a low musical speech of Aino guides, for the harsh and ceaseless clatter of Japanese. At Yamakushinoi, a small hamlet on the seashore where I slept, there was a sweet, quiet yadoya, delightfully situated, with a wooded cliff at the back, over which a crescent hung out of pure sky, and besides there were the more solid pleasures of fish, eggs, and black beans. Thus, instead of being starved and finding wretched accommodation, the week I spent on Volcano Bay has been the best fed, as it was certainly the most comfortable week of my travels in northern Japan. Another glorious day favoured my ride to Mori, but I was unfortunate in my horse at each stage, and the Japanese guide was grumpy and ill-natured, a most unusual thing. Otoshibe and a few other small villages of grey houses with an ancient and fish-like smell lie along the coast, busy enough doubtless in the season, but now looking deserted and decayed, and houses are rather plentifully sprinkled among many parts of the shore, with a wonderful profusion of vegetables and flowers about them, raised from seeds liberally supplied by the Kaitakushi department from its Nanai experimental farm and nurseries. For a considerable part of the way to Mori there is no track at all, though there is a good deal of travel. One makes one's way fatiguingly along soft sea sand or coarse shingle close to the sea, or absolutely in it, under cliffs of hardened clay or yellow conglomerate, fording many small streams, several of which have cut their way deeply through a stratum of black volcanic sand. I have crossed about one hundred rivers and streams on the Yezo coast, and all the larger ones are marked by a most noticeable peculiarity, that is, that on nearing the sea they turn south, and run for some distance parallel with it, before they succeed in finding an exit through the bank of sand and shingle which forms the beach and blocks their progress. On the way I saw two Ainos land through the surf in a canoe in which they had paddled for nearly one hundred miles. A river canoe is dug out of a single log and two men can fashion one in five days, but on examining this one, which was twenty-five feet long, I found that it consisted of two halves, laced together with very strong bark fibre for their whole length and with high sides also laced on. They consider that they are stronger for rough sea and surf work when made in two parts. Their bark fibre rope is beautifully made, and they twist it of all sizes, from twine up to a nine-inch holster. Beautiful as the blue ocean was, I had too much of it, for the horses were either walking in a leather of sea foam or were crowded between the cliff and the sea every larger wave breaking over my foot and irreverently splashing my face, and the surges were so loud-tongued and incessant, throwing themselves on the beach with a tremendous boom, and drawing the shingle back with them with an equally tremendous rattle, so impolite and noisy, bent only on showing their strength, reckless, rude, self-willed, and inconsiderate. 
this purposeless display of force and this incessant waste of power and the noisy self-assertion in both approach vulgarity towards evening we crossed the last of the bridgeless rivers and put up at mori which i left three weeks before and i was very thankful to have accomplished my object without disappointment disaster or any considerable discomfort had i not promised to return ito to his master by a given day i should like to spend the next six weeks in the yezo wilds for the climate is good the scenery beautiful and the objects of interest are many another splendid day favoured my ride from mori to togenoshita where i remained for the night and i had exceptionally good horses for both days though the one which ito rode while well, going at a rapid scramble threw himself down three times and rolled over to rid himself from flies i had not admired the wood between mori and ginsainoma the lakes on the sullen grey day on which i saw it before but this time there was an abundance of light and shadow and solar glitter and many a scarlet spray and crimson trailer and many a maple flaming in the valleys gladdened me with the music of colour from the top of the pass beyond the lakes there is a grand view of the volcano in all its nakedness with its lava beds and fields of pumice with the lakes of onuma konuma and ginsainuma lying in the forests at its feet and from the top of another hill there is a remarkable view of windy hakodate with its headland looking like gibraltar the slopes of this hill are covered with the aconitum japonicum of which the ainos make their arrow poison the yadoya at togenoshita was a very pleasant and friendly one and when ito woke me yesterday morning saying are you sorry that it's the last morning i am i felt we had one subject in common for i was very sorry to end my pleasant yezo tour and very sorry to part with the boy who had made himself more useful and invaluable even than before it was most wearisome to have hakodate in sight for twelve miles so near across the bay so far across the long flat stony strip which connects the headland upon which it is built with the mainland for about three miles the road is rudely macadamized and as soon as the barefooted horses get upon it they seem lame of all their legs they hang back stumbling dragging edging to the side and trying to run down every opening so that when we got into the interminable main street i sent ito to the consulate for my letters and dismounted hoping that as it was raining i should not see any foreigners but i was not so lucky for first i met mr denning and then seeing the consul and dr hepburn coming down the road evidently dressed for dining in the flagship and looking spruce and clean i dodged up an alley to avoid them but they saw me and did not wonder that i wished to escape notice for my old betto's hat my torn green paper waterproof and my riding skirt and boots were not only splashed but caked with mud and i had the general look of a person fresh from the wilds i l b itinerary of tour in yezo hakodate to ginzainoma four japanese houses seven ri eighteen cho hakodate to mori one hundred and five japanese houses Fori. Hakodate to Morodan, fifty seven Japanese houses, eleven ri. Hakodate to Horobetsu, eighteen Japanese, forty seven Aino houses, five ri, one cho. Hakodate to Shiraoi, eleven Japanese, fifty one Aino houses, six ri, thirty two cho. Hakodate to Tomakomai, thirty eight Japanese houses, five ri, twenty one cho. Hakodate to Yubetsu, seven Japanese, three Aino houses, three ri, five cho. Hakodate to Sarufuto, sixty three Japanese houses, seven ri, five cho. 
Hakodate to Biratori. Fifty three Aino houses. Five Ri. Hakodate to Mombetsu. Twenty seven Japanese houses. Five Ri. One Cho. From Horobetsu to Old Murodan. Nine Japanese. Thirty Aino houses. Four Ri. Twenty eight Cho. From Horobetsu to Uzu. Three Japanese, ninety-nine Aino houses. Six three, two cho. From Horobetsu to Lebunge, one Japanese, twenty-seven Aino houses. Five three, twenty-two cho. From Horobetsu to Oshamambe, fifty-six Japanese, thirty-eight Aino houses. Six three, thirty-four cho. From Horobetsu to Yamakushinai, Forty Japanese houses. Fori, eighteen cho. From Horobetsu to Otoshibe, forty Japanese houses. Turi, three cho. From Horobetsu to Mori, one hundred and five Japanese houses. Three ri, twenty nine cho. From Horobetsu to Togenoshita, fifty five Japanese houses. Six ri, seven cho. From Horobetsu to Hakodate, thirty-seven thousand souls, three ri, twenty-nine cho, about three hundred fifty-eight English miles. End of section fifty-four. Section fifty-five of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 42. Hakodate, Yezo, September 14, 1878. This is my last day in Yezo, and the sun, shining brightly over the grey and windy capital, is touching the pink peaks of Komunotaki with a deeper red, and is brightening my last impressions, which, like my first, are very pleasant. The bay is deep blue, flecked with violet shadows, and about sixty junks are floating upon it at anchor. There are vessels of foreign rig, too, but the one, pale junks, lying motionless or rolling into the harbour under their great white sails, fascinate me as when I first saw them in the Gulf of Yedo. They are antique-looking and picturesque, but are fitter to give interest to a picture than to battle with stormy seas. Most of the junks in the bay are about 120 tons burthen, 100 feet long, with an extreme beam far aft of 25 feet. The bow is long and curves into a lofty stem, like that of a Roman galley, finished with a beak head to secure the forestay of the mast. This beak is furnished with two large goggle eyes. The mast is a ponderous spar, 50 feet high, composed of pieces of pine, pegged, glued and hooped together. A heavy yard is hung amidships. The sail is an oblong of widths of strong white cotton, artistically puckered, not sewn together, but laced vertically, leaving a decorative lacing six inches wide between each two widths. Instead of reefing in a strong wind, a width is unlaced so as to reduce the canvas vertically, not horizontally. Two blue spheres commonly adorn the sail. The mast is placed well abaft, and to tack or veer it is only necessary to reverse the sheet. When on a wind, the long bow and nose serve as a headsail. The high, square piled up stern, with its antique carving and the sides with their letter work, are wonderful, together with the extraordinary size and projection of the rudder and the length of the tiller. The anchors are of grapnel shape, and the larger junks have from six to eight arranged on the fore end, giving one an idea of bad holding ground along the coast. They really are much like the shape of a Chinese small-footed woman's shoe and look very unmanageable. They are of unpainted wood and have a wintry, ghastly look about them. I have parted with Ito finally today, with great regret. 
he has served me faithfully, and on most common topics I can get much more information through him than from any foreigner. I miss him already, though he insisted on packing for me as usual, and put all my things in order. His cleverness is something surprising. He goes to a good, manly master, who will help him to be good and set him a virtuous example, and that is a satisfaction. Before he left, he wrote a letter for me to the governor of Mororan, thanking him on my behalf for the use of the kuruma and other courtesies. I.L.B. End of section 55「Section 56 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan」by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. Letter 43. HBM's Legation, Yedo, September 21st. A placid sea, which after much disturbance had sighed itself to rest, and a high, steady barometer promised a fifty hours passage to Yokohama, and when Dr. and Mrs. Hepburn and I left Hakodate, by moonlight on the night of the 14th, as the only passengers in the Hyogo Maru, Captain Moore, her general, pleasant master, congratulated us on the rapid and delightful passage before us, and we separated at midnight with many projects for pleasant intercourse and occupation. But a more miserable voyage I never made, and it was not until the afternoon of the 17th that we crawled forth from our cabins to speak to each other. On the second day out, great heat came on with suffocating closeness, the mercury rose to 85 degrees, and in latitude 38 degrees 0 minutes north, and longitude 141 degrees 30 minutes east, we encountered a typhoon, otherwise a cyclone, otherwise a revolving hurricane, which lasted for 25 hours and jettisoned the cargo. Captain Moore has given me a very interesting diagram of it, showing the attempts which he made to avoid its vortex, through which our course would have taken us, and to keep as much outside it as possible. The typhoon was succeeded by a dense fog, so that our fifty-hour passage became seventy-two hours, and we landed at Yokohama near upon midnight on the 17th, to find traces of much disaster, the whole low-lying country flooded, the railway between Yokohama and the capital impassable, great anxiety about the rice crop, the air full of alarmist rumours, and paper money, which was about par when I arrived in May, at a discount of 13 per cent. In the early part of this year, 1880, it has touched 42 per cent. Late in the afternoon the railroad was reopened, and I came here with Mr. Wilkinson, glad to settle down to a period of rest and ease under this hospitable roof. The afternoon was bright and sunny, and Tokyo was looking its best. The long lines of yashikis looked handsome. The castle moat was so full of the gigantic leaves of the lotus that the water was hardly visible. The grass embankments of the upper moat were a brilliant green. The pines on their summits stood out boldly against a clear sky, the hill on which the legation stands looked dry and cheerful, and, better than all, I had a most kindly welcome from those who have made this house my home in a strange land. Tokyo is tranquil, that is, it is disturbed only by fears for the rice crop and by the fall in Satsu. The military mutineers have been tried, popular rumour says tortured, and fifty-two have been shot. The summer has been the worst for some years, and now dark heat, moist heat, and nearly ceaseless rain prevail. People have been rained up in their summer quarters. Surely it will change soon, people say, and they have said the same thing for three months. I. L. B. End of section 56 Section 57 of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Avai in October 2012. 
Letter 44. HBM's Legation, Yedo, December 18. I have spent the last ten days here, in settled fine weather, such as should have begun two months ago, if the climate had behaved as it ought. The time has flown by in excursions, shopping, select little dinner parties, farewell calls, and visits made with Mr. Chamberlain to the famous groves and temples of Ikegami, where the Buddhist bishop and priests entertained us in one of the guest rooms, and to Enoshima and Kamakura, vulgar resorts which nothing can vulgarize so long as Fujisan towers above them. I will mention but one sight, which is so far out of the beaten track that it was only after prolonged inquiry that its whereabouts were ascertained. Among Buddhists, especially of the Monto sect, cremation was largely practiced till it was forbidden five years ago, as some suppose in deference to European prejudices. Three years ago, however, the prohibition was withdrawn, and in this short space of time the number of bodies burned has reached already 9,000 annually. Sir H. Parks applied for permission for me to visit the Kirigaya ground, one of five, and after a few delays it was granted by the governor of Tokyo at Mr. Mori's request, so, yesterday, attended by the legation linguist, I presented myself at the fine yashiki of the Tokyo Fu, and, quite unexpectedly, was admitted to an audience of the governor. Mr. Kusamoto is a well-bred gentleman, and his face expresses the energy and ability which he has given proof of possessing. He wears his European clothes becomingly, and in attitude, as well as manner, is easy and dignified. After asking me a great deal about my northern tour and the Ainos, he expressed a wish for candid criticism, but as this in the East must not be taken literally, I merely venture to say that the roads lag behind the progress made in other directions, upon which he entered upon explanations which doubtless apply to the past road history of the country. He spoke of cremation and its necessity in large cities, and terminated the interview by requesting me to dismiss my interpreter and Kuruma, as he was going to send me to Meguro in his own carriage, with one of the government interpreters, adding very courteously that it gave him pleasure to show his attention to a guest of the British minister, for whose character and important services to Japan he has a high value. An hour's drive, with an extra amount of yelling from the bettos, took us to a suburb of little hills and valleys, where red camellias and feathery bamboo against backgrounds of cryptomeria contrast with the grey monotone of British winters, and, alighting at a farm road too rough for a carriage, we passed through fields and hedgerows to an erection which looks too insignificant for such solemn news. Don't expect any ghastly details. A longish building of wattle and dab, much like the northern farmhouses, a high roof, and chimneys resembling those of the oast houses in Kent, combine with the rural surroundings to suggest farm buildings rather than the funeral pyre, and all that is horrible is left to the imagination. The end nearest the road is a little temple, much crowded with images, and small, red, earthenware urns and tongs for sale to the relatives of deceased persons, and beyond this are four rooms with earthen floors and mud walls, nothing noticeable about them except the height of the peaked roof and the dark colour of the plaster. In the middle of the largest are several pairs of granite supports at equal distances from each other, and in the smallest there is a solitary pair. This was literally all that was to be seen. In the large room several bodies are burnt at one time, and the charge is only one yen, about three shillings eight pounds, solitary cremation costing five yen. Faggots are used, and one shilling worth ordinarily suffices to reduce a human form to ashes. After the funeral service in the house, the body is brought to the cremation ground, and is left in charge of the attendant, a melancholy, smoked-looking man, as well he may be. The richer people sometimes pay priests to be present during the burning, but this is not usual. 
there were five quick tubs of pine hooped with bamboo in the larger room containing the remains of coolies and a few oblong pine chests in the small rooms containing those of middle-class people at eight p m each coffin is placed on the stone trestles the faggots are lighted underneath the fires are replenished during the night and by six a m that which was a human being is a small heap of ashes which is placed in an urn by the relatives and is honourably interred. In some cases, the priests accompany the relations on this last mournful errand. Thirteen bodies were burned the night before my visit, but there was not the slightest odour in or about the building, and the interpreter told me that, owing to the height of the chimneys, the people of the neighbourhood never experience the least annoyance, even while the process is going on. The simplicity of the arrangement is very remarkable, and there can be no reasonable doubt that it serves the purpose of the innocuous and complete destruction of the corpse, as well as any complicated apparatus, if not better, while its cheapness places it within the reach of the class which is most heavily burdened by ordinary funeral expenses. This morning the governor sent his secretary to present me with a translation of an interesting account of the practice of cremation and its introduction into Japan. SS Volga, Christmas Eve, 1878 The snowy dome of Fujisan reddening in the sunrise rose above the violet woodlands of Mississippi Bay as we steamed out of Yokohama on the 19th and three days later I saw the last of Japan, a rugged coast lashed by a wintry sea. ILB End of section 57 End of Unbeaten Tracks in Japan by Isabella L. Bird Thanks for listening.